Uh, on behalf of the California chapter of the American Society of Agronomy, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2021 California Plant and Soil Conference. My name is Eric Ellison and I'm this year's chapter president. This is my seventh year serving the board as an industry representative. I work for a startup company based called, well, it's called Plant Response Incorporated based in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Uh, this morning, uh, as everyone is filing in and getting comfortable with how to use the Zoom, um, I wanted to provide a little background on the chapter, the uh, California chapter. Uh, you can find details about it in the uh, on the website and in the book of abstracts. Uh, the constitution and bylaws are listed there. You can find more details there. But basically, our our chapter shares the same primary ob objectives as the uh, American Society of Agronomy. And uh, briefly, and I'll just read that uh, Cal ASA strives to promote human welfare through advancing the acquisition and dissemination of scientific knowledge concerning the nature, use, improvement, and interrelationships of plants, soils, and the environment. So there's a lot that goes in into play around that, but um, just in keeping with these objectives, uh, the content of our program must be scientifically rigorous and cannot be a promotion of proprietary products. So uh, research scientists who often participate in our program uh, strive to make use of what they learn and know to achieve outcomes of benefit to society. And uh, hopefully uh, you appreciate the scientific rigor and content of today's program and come away with or learn something you can use. Uh, hopefully, you know, I know these talks are interesting, but hopefully at the same time, there's something you gain from them and learn. So Cal ASA membership includes anyone who is in attendance today. Uh, so there are no membership dues actually other than registration fees to this conference. So uh, you, by participating today, are a member of the California chapter. And uh, we try to keep the registration fees to a minimum. And uh, so the chapter is a, is a nonprofit uh, entity. So we're not trying to do business here or anything. We're just trying to provide information. So about this virtual conference each year, uh, a group of 14 volunteers or governing board members come together to create this conference. And uh, this year, uh, we made a decision in September because we start planning this conference in the during the summer months. And we made a decision in, in September to hold a virtual conference for obvious reasons. And uh, so we were thinking about various ways to do that. And and some people on the board who are UC employees suggested that we uh, try UC ANR program support services. So we explored that. And uh, because many of our speakers and many of our board members are UC employees, uh, the program support unit kindly offered to run our conference for us this year. So. Um, we did explore some other options, and most of those options were far more expensive than what we, we could get. And, and many of those organizations that wanted to do our conf conference weren't as well connected to our industry and uh, academia like program support unit. So it was really, I think, an excellent decision to go with program support. And I just want to uh, give a... a a uh, load of thanks to uh, Sherry Ford and uh, Rachel Palmer with the Program Support Unit who have really helped us a lot. They've responded to just about all of our needs and uh, been proactive in providing the service that we expected um, to run this conference. It's, it's really taken a lot of the load off of our hands. So we're really pleased to, to be working with Program Support Unit and hope that uh, we can continue to do that in the future. Um, 
But because this conference is virtual, uh, we decided to make all of the sessions available to um, everyone. Normally for the in-person meeting, we, we go into breakout sessions. And, uh, but this, because of the virtual format, uh, uh, we have the opportunity to, to let you attend all the sessions. And I know that it's a three days of conference. Uh, today is kind of a long day, but uh, Tuesday and Wednesday are both half days. So hopefully that's manageable for you. Uh, we hope to get some feedback on on the length and all of the goings on of the conference. And uh, at the end, uh, I think program support will be sending an email out asking for evaluations. And I'm hoping that we'll get your feedback about how all of this went and how possibly it can be improved. But anyway, you'll have access to all of the sessions and all of the credits, uh, continuing education units associated with those sessions. So that could be a benefit to you. So I'd like to point out some special programs. Uh, you're all invited as members, you're invited to attend any of the programs uh, that are available over the next couple of days. In addition to the scientific program, which there are eight sessions and one special session, uh, this afternoon, beginning at 1225, we will recognize this year's Cal ASA honorees, Marsha Campbell Matthews and Keith Backman. Normally the chapter recognizes our honorees during the business meeting, which concludes the conference. But this year due to a scheduling conflict, we, we created a special session for the honoree program. And uh, I invite you and I encourage all of you to attend and uh, please attend to hear about Keith and Marsha's uh, career achievements. Uh, Carol Freight and Nat Dallavelli will be presenting Keith and Marcia. And after the honorary program, beginning at 2 p.m., the student presentations will begin. And uh, students normally participate in the poster session. And since that was not possible this year, we decided to go with a different format and hold these lightning presentations. And these presentations will be judged as part of a, a student competition. And uh, you are encouraged to attend and support these students uh, to, to view their presentations. I think it will be interesting. And uh, I think most of us would agree that the in-person poster session, including the evening social and the food and beverages is a much better format by which to interact with students. Uh, but I'm glad we were able to offer this opportunity for students to showcase their, showcase their research research efforts in a professional venue. And uh, I just wanted to point out uh, for these students that uh, they're doing their best in a pandemic really to, to learn and further their education and academic pursuits. So I think it's worthwhile to support them. And special thanks go out to board members, uh, uh, Nick Clark and Mark Katie for taking on this task of planning and organizing the student presentations. And uh, finally at 1 p.m. tomorrow, we will conduct the Cal ASA business meeting. Uh, again, as members, you are all invited to attend. Uh, you can find the business meeting agenda in the book of abstracts. Uh, and uh, items covered will include the chapter financial report and the election of new board members to the Council of Representatives. So you can vote if you want to. It's, it's more of a formality, but it's interesting to attend and see who the new members will be. And we will also announce the winners of the student lightning presentation competition and the student scholarship. And uh, these student awards are made possible by the donations from our sponsors, which this year are Western Plant Health Association, Mid Valley Agricultural Services and Valley Tech Agricultural Laboratories. Thank you so much to our sponsors and your generous donations contribute greatly to our student awards program and are very much appreciated. And I would like to thank all of the conference speakers for your contribution uh, to Cal ASA. The content and information you presented was, is what draws so many of to our conference and, and what makes it interesting. I would also like to thank all the 
members of the governing board for once again, working together to create an excellent program. Every year, I've been doing this for seven years and every year it seems to all come together. <laughs> Not, we're a group of volunteers and you know we have day jobs. This isn't our permanent job to run a conference and uh, but uh, it all seems to come together every year and this year was no different. And finally, I would like to thank everyone who registered for the conference for your participation today and the next couple of days. This year's uh, registration was complimentary to any California college student. And as a result, there are around 100 students, uh, many of whom are from Fresno State, who will be attending the conference as part of coursework. So welcome to everyone. And uh, I hope you enjoy the conference. And I'll turn it over to uh, Jeff Dahlberg for our first session. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our special session. Uh, it's a COVID-19 update. And uh, <laughs> to say that this has not been a strange uh, long year, I think would be an understatement. I think everybody back in March was moving uh, along, thinking about research projects and all the ag research work that we needed to get started and done uh, for this coming year. And that kind of all got thrown out the window in March. And um, with the impact of COVID, um, definitely limiting our ability to move around the state and continue our research uh, programs throughout the state. So it did have severe impacts on many of the programs around, um, around California and around the country. Uh, Kearney, tried staying open as best we could. Uh, we implemented some pretty severe restrictions on who could come onto the center and what we could continue to do. Um, and that again, either slowed down some programs, canceled quite a few programs, uh, but for the most part, a lot of our um, permanent crops, perennial crop research just continued on uh, just with some severe restrictions on being able to get out to the field. I think the other thing that happened, especially around here in the Valley was uh, when COVID started, the big stories were all in the big cities, right? So New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, we didn't really hear very much about what was going on with COVID in the Valley and especially in our ag community. Um, people continue to go to the stores, uh, purchase food, products and agricultural products. Um, and we never really did hear very much about the impact of COVID on agricultural um, issues or uh, production, even in major news outlets. And so um, one of the things that we as a board talked about was, you know, what kind of impact did COVID have on the ag community? And because of that, we asked uh, Nan Sumners from the UC Ag Issue Center at Davis uh, to give us a, an overview of the economic impacts of the pandemic uh, here in California. And looking at the data and what that data represented and maybe a path forward through this COVID as uh, the vaccines become available and we try to get back to a little bit of a normal life. So with that, uh, I'm, like to introduce Dan and uh, Dan, let's uh, get you started. I'm gonna take uh, uh, about a half an hour. I wanna tell you some stuff we've been doing. Uh, this is a different talk that uh, I, I started giving COVID and agriculture talks back in March. Uh, and of course things evolve pretty quickly. And, and I focused uh, sometimes on vegetables and sometimes on the dairy industry or uh, the meat packing closures, you name it, uh, the issue of the day and what the economic implications of that are. I, I'm not gonna go step through all that. Uh, uh, we could do a blow by blow, a week by week uh, history of, of the economics of COVID and agriculture. And that'd be, that'd be one way to, to spend a half an hour with you. But I decided to do a little something different. Uh, I do wanna start off by saying, all our regular issues, and, and we heard this uh, uh, from Jeff a second ago uh, at Kearney, 
all our regular issues, uh, whether it's irrigation water, or farm labor availability, global competition, demand chain. I go this through this long list here in California, regulation uh, pressures, innovation, the sort of things that uh, those of us that talk uh, to growers and, and to pay attention, uh, all of that continued unabated. And, and But this talk is about the pandemic. Clearly some of those issues are still with us, but if, if we were talking about where's agriculture in general in California and in the West, I'd be talking about uh, uh, groundwater regulation and uh, is this year a drought and, and all those worries that we normally have, um, including uh, labor regulations and, and, and uh, uh, minimum wages increasing all of that. Uh, to start with the pandemic, uh, there was death and dislocation on a grand scale globally. So we're talking about uh, millions of people dying from a pandemic. Uh, and we don't wanna lose sight of that. Uh, so I'm gonna start talking about dollars and cents in a second, uh, but, but the big issue is the human suffering that goes along with this. And as usual, the people that uh, came through it the worst were the poorest people on the planet. And they are still, uh, it, it, for many of them, the worst is, is still yet to come because they don't have access to the vaccine that uh, many of us will, will be having soon or have already uh, taken advantage of. Uh, and I just wanna put that out there because it's, it's uh, a big part of agriculture because of course many of those people are, are on farms globally or working on farms here in California for that matter. Uh, there was great disruption on the early days on food demand across marketing channels. And so when, and we all know uh, the, the first thing uh, we started noticing was food service and restaurants and the like, uh, basically shutting down because they were told by law they had to shut down and that was enforced. Uh, most people were, were pretty good about it. most businesses who saw their businesses uh, sometimes being destroyed, destroyed fairly quickly uh, nonetheless complied with the regulations and went along uh, for, for the good of the community. And, and, and there is still a, a big debate among economists and others, uh, uh, and I mean public health economists, about the payoff to, to those kind of uh, shutdowns. That's not our topic today. It's not my field of study. But I can tell you that poverty is uh, pretty deadly too. We talked about that a second ago. So that is hitting people's incomes, putting them out of work, telling them to stay home is a public health issue itself. And, and we had to balance that and we could debate whether we balanced it right as a community. And again, I'm not gonna get into it, but I wanna allow it to be a part of the, uh, uh, a part of the information. So uh, companies, uh, food companies or products that were specialized in restaurants I had a friend uh, in the cattle business who shipped uh, at the high end part of the cattle business. Uh, most of his product was being shipped to, a, to cafeterias at Google and, and Facebook. Uh, well, they shut down immediately. Uh, he scrambled, uh, had a good reputation, was able to get his stuff in direct to consumer and in supermarkets that had been wanting uh, to get access to his products. Uh, but that kind of disruption uh, across the food marketing system fairly quickly um, was mo moderated. And the reason is that people were still eating. And so it's, it's not the case that food demand went down. People ate as much as ever, and I'll show you. Now, maybe what they ate changed a bit. And for a little while, just about everybody I know was gorging on banana bread, but that didn't last all that long. There were still significant changes. We'll talk about those. Uh, the disruption on the farming, uh, processing, packaging, and shipping uh, was partly due to the marketing shifts, but then fairly quickly due to labor concerns, including uh, uh, sometimes shutdowns, sometimes spacing, and we're familiar with the added costs of having fewer workers uh, uh, near each other and what that meant. Sometimes the disruption was minor, Sometimes it was at substantial costs on machinery and the like. But 
uh, uh, disease among the vital workers and their families, I think, was the biggest issue that we faced. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there were economic outcomes during the pandemic year, it's, but it's frankly hard to show major disruption. And uh, that is lasting disruption in the dollars and cents. That is to say the food system was remarkably resilient. Uh, I had people, reporters would call me and say, oh gee, the food system fell apart, right? And I'd say, well, how'd you do today? You have breakfast? Yeah, well, of course, you know. But, you know the point was uh, people with income could stay fed and the government did to their credit, a remarkable job of spreading income around just as much as possible to get those into the hands of people whose income disappeared. And uh, we expanded food stamps, we expanded school lunch, we changed the rules on school lunch when schools were shut so that families got uh, money. It was all happened with a delay and there were real serious hardships. There was money that went to food banks and, and other ways of distributing mostly cash or something pretty darn close to cash. And that was crucial for lots of families. Most people came through that without great disruption. And in fact, saving rates went up in 2020, not down. Incomes went up, not down. And that's important to recognize. Uh, there were companies that didn't survive uh, but the food system itself came through. So that's the overview. Now I wanna dig into some data and I'm gonna show you some farm income and cash receipts. Uh, those are na national numbers. We don't have specific California numbers, but I'm gonna bring it back a bit to California. Uh, uh, the biggest story was really is a big story and is under told uh, in talking about agriculture. The story was that I want to go into has to do with produce shipments, and that's a specifically or almost specifically California story. I'm going to show you produce shipments and prices and how do they compare in 2020 uh, compared to prior years. This is uh, AMS data, Agricultural Marketing Service data, week by week, specific representative commodities. So we're as much as possible uh, really comparing apples to apples, literally, and carrots to carrots. Uh, and this is, mo uh, the apples, by the way, come from Washington State. The best data for apples and cherries was Washington State shipments. And that's a, a reasonable comparison to what we have here in California. But let's turn to farm income quickly. These are national numbers. Uh, cash receipts is the top line. And this is compared to 2019. 2018 was slightly higher than 2019. But what you see there is when it comes to cash receipts, almost no difference between 2019 and 2020. For crops, uh, crop cash receipts were up, not down. So this is just, when it says cash receipts, it's, it's just what you think it is. It's prices times quantity sold. There's some inventory changes. We could, there's lots of subtleties we could get into, but I'm not going to uh, for this talk. Well, I'm showing you a slide of farm income and, and it's uh, a bunch of numbers that you can see, but I wanna highlight uh, this farm payments, which have uh, doubled from one year to the next and they would, had already gone up by about 60%. Cash expenses went down slightly. That's partly because of livestock prices uh, uh, and, and certain uh, grain prices for most much of the year. Uh, but net cash income, was up by 25% or 22% from 1919. And it was already up a bit in, from 28 to 19. Uh, these numbers are a little bit different, uh, but, but here I just wanna focus on the cash receipts by commodity. And I'm only gonna talk about the ones that are in blue and, and bold and bigger, because those are the ones that we produce here in California. We're about uh, 18, 19% of the milk production in, this, in the country and milk uh, revenue was up. So these, you can think of these as farm revenues. They're very close to that. As I pointed out before, crops are up slightly compared to 2019, about the same as 2018. If, and of course, we produce all these crops. So we produce rice and wheat a bit. We produce hay. 
uh, not many of the other feed crops, but a, but a good bit of the hay. We produce now a relatively small amount of the cotton, uh, very little of the oil seeds, which is almost all soybeans, but you get down to vegetables and melons and California's half of that. And that's up, just slightly, but up. Uh, this is revenue numbers. And fruits and nuts were over half of that. A uh, lot of tree nuts in there. And, and you notice they're up substantially. So the story when it comes to farm income, if somebody said, look, we had a disastrous pandemic, uh, wasn't 2020 terrible? The answer is no. Not even when it comes to cash receipts, it wasn't terrible. Uh, let me uh, let me mention dairy quickly because it's, of course, a big purchase. The dairy industry is a big purchaser of feed products. And for dairy, uh, milk production was up throughout the Western states all year long. You see the pandemic pretty strongly here only in that milk production went down from March to April when normally it goes up. April is usually the first of the flush uh, uh, is, is uh, with March, uh, uh, an expanded milk production. And this year it was down. Uh, it fairly quick, it prices, this is, uh, prices were also down so milk production followed. Milk production normally falls. Notice the scale here. This, this is going from uh, uh, average daily production of 2.65 uh, uh, million hundred weight per day up to 285. So these, these uh, I, I did the scale here so you could actually see what's going on, but these are fairly substantial increases in 2020 in milk production. So whatever you may have heard, the dairy industry expanded and dairy income, uh, as I showed you in a previous slide, is actually up and up fairly significantly, two or 3%. But what about government payments? Uh, 2017, 12 billion, 2018, 14 billion, a big jump in something called market facilitation program. Started in 2018, uh, this was uh, the administration's attempt to pass out money to farms, uh, writing checks to farms uh, based on how much they lost uh, in the trade war of 2018 and 2019. That was still a lot of money in 2020 by normal standards, but not a lot of money compared to the supplemental and ad hoc disaster assistance. All the COVID payments that were made strictly to agriculture from USDA so this isn't all the rest of the PPP and, and the general business programs. This is strictly the farm program side of this. Substantial amount of money uh, in those programs. And, and actually, it's, it's, uh, this is an underestimate. This is some numbers I had in the late fall, uh, November. So by the end of the year, uh, this had been projected to be 37 billion till the end of the year. It actually went up more than that. It was over 40 billion. But it gives you the picture, big chunk of money. So the government uh, uh, COVID payments, a little more than 23 billion, but the overall CARES Act payments, that T stands for trillion. We're not used to looking at that. So you say, gee, 23 billion in farm payments, that's a lot for, for a pandemic. Uh, but it pales in comparison, about 1%, about 1%. That's about the share of farming in the GDP. Uh, we're now nationwide, we're about a little over 1% in California. Nationwide, uh, last year we were about 0.6%. So we also, farming also got money from the uh, Small Business Administration, et cetera. But overall, agriculture was, uh, uh, well over 1% of the total, and in, as a measure not of sales in the economy, but of GDP, uh, a little more than a third of that. Was farming hurt worse? Maybe. Uh, it's less clear. Uh, it, I do want to highlight also the government payments for agriculture were also important when we made food pay, when we made payments to people so that they could afford food. So the rich, most of the people attending this, not you, that 
most of you think of yourselves as rich, but not on food stamps or school lunch or WIC program. Uh, the people that do benefit from those programs, half the children in America, uh, those programs were all expanded as rapidly and as much as they could, uh, but with delays and that left people in trouble. And we all read about that, I hope. Uh, the, the overall uh, 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 unemployment, et cetera, and, and, and $1,000 checks, uh, that would also help keep food demand where it was. So where's California and all the uh, federal support? Uh, you can see uh, this is the federal support as a share of uh, gross farm income. This happens to be 1919, uh, 2019 data. It'll be the same in 2020. These are the kind of numbers. The Midwest and the South gets uh, up to 10 or 11 percent uh, uh, of their income from government farm payments. Iowa and Texas, the next two biggest farm states, get about 7%, California is 1%. And even with crop insurance and a few things like that, even the COVID payments that initially were thought to be spread more evenly across agriculture, they really went to uh, what, if you're in California, you might think of as the likely suspects. Uh, mostly by commodity. So peanuts are by far the biggest subsidized commodity as a, a relative to revenue. Uh, uh, southern rice, not California rice, southern cotton, not ELS cotton, uh, and then corn, soybeans, and, and on down the line. Uh, these payments were not to poor and disadvantaged farmers. So if you've had ever had an idea that farm payments are designed to help poor farmers, uh, that's just not true. It never has been true. It's still not true. Uh, essentially zero go to people in poverty. Not absolutely zero, just approximately zero, rounding here. They are distributed roughly in proportion of production of the covered commodities. And the West tends to produce a lot less than that. So these are business payments. They are um, uh, payments uh, with the rationale that this business needs help, this industry needs help. And we could debate that or not, uh, but that's the rationale of the payments. Now let's turn to California cash receipts, about 50 billion, about 14% of national agriculture, uh, bigger than Iowa and Texas put together. Our receipts are about 75% crops, even though dairy is the number one commodity in California in terms of farm revenue. Uh, the other, uh, the meat and poultry products are very small in California compared to the rest of the country. It's a few billion dollars, but in California agriculture, that's small, much smaller than the share of those products in the rest of the country. Uh, it's also uh, worth noting, by the way, that meat animals are counted double or triple because they're sold within agriculture as they go through the value chain. Uh, California is also less seasonal, much more labor intensive, less land intensive, and produce is a big deal. Let's talk about produce, and I want to move more quickly here. Uh, as I go through, um, the, the, uh, this, this gives you three years. Uh, let me switch to the COVID, what I'm going to call the COVID years, uh, starting in March 15th or so. So this compares produce shipments starting in March through the end of the year for three calendar years. I put Washington apples and cherries together. No real change up a little bit in 2020. Berries. Uh, up from 2019, but down from 2018, because there was a big drop from 2018 to 2019. These are quantity ship. These are billions of pounds. Oh, that title should not say pounds. It should say billions. That's my typo. Uh, so this one I does say billions of pounds. Uh, this, this one should also say billions of pounds. Uh, nectarines and peaches, again, up, down in 2020 back roughly where it was in 2018. So every one of these crops follow a di different pattern. You know, some are alternate bearing, things like that. Some are just steadily going down. Melons has been going down for a while in California. Uh, again, this is pound shipped, but uh, 2020 for melons was a very low year. 
leafy greens higher than last year's and I could go down the list. Other vegetables are substantially up. So if I look at that and say, wow, a terrible pandemic, you say, well, I don't see it in the shipment numbers. I looked at every one of the individual commodities behind these, and these are done by individual commodity, and I'm gonna show you some charts. So here's total fruit from, from California. This is just the California fruits, uh, so it doesn't include the apples and cherries. COVID-19 year, uh, uh, this is the calendar year. The band there is, is the middle of March. These are weeks of the year uh, from one to 52. And it follows this cycle you would expect for uh, with peaking in the summertime. But there's lots of uh, berries shipped back here in the spring and winter. And uh, you get so, so I would say this red peak here just in the middle of COVID was a bunch of shipments that people were making. And then uh, there was a disruption uh, and a dip, and then we're back to normal. It's hard, other than that, and that is a big deal temporarily, it's a little hard to see what COVID-19 did here in total sh uh, fruit shipments. What about berries themselves? The weirdest thing on this chart is weird data. This is, we double checked and triple checked this number. This is what the Agricultural uh, uh, Marketing Service reports. It's almost surely wrong. That is to say there were shipments that somehow didn't get counted that week. But that's what happens when, you, when, you, when you're relying on shipment data. Again, I don't see a big difference between 2019 and the others. Uh, it peaks a little higher. There's certainly periods in which 2018 is above 2019 week by week. And you get this uh, disruption back here, I think. But this one happens after the pandemic. Was it, what, was, there more, was there more disruption in the shipments? Perhaps so. Let's look at strawberries specifically. That dominates the berries. Again, uh, strawberries uh, for the year as a whole, are above 2018, a little before below 2019. And I don't see, if someone said it was a disastrous year, you don't see it in the strawberry shipments. How about grapes? And here we're seeing more. And the interesting thing here is, uh, whereas the strawberries, you have much more flexibility. Grapes, you harvest what you got. These are California grapes shipped. Uh, you see them picking up in the early summer. Um, but they don't reach the peak that they did in the prior two years. Uh, there are two hypotheses here, and I can't distinguish yet between them. I will. One is yields were lower. Some of you in this room know this, know the answer to this question. The other is maybe, of course, these are hand harvested. These are uh, these are wine. Uh, excuse me, table grapes, hand harvested. Is it the case? that people had fields they didn't get harvested or they harvested more quickly, leaving more grapes on the vine uh, during the middle of the peak season or were yields lower. Normally we'd say, yeah, yields are up and down. We wouldn't think, gee, did the pan pandemic call, cause labor disruption. But that's certainly a hypothesis that we may consider for grapes. It didn't happen for strawberries, which is also very labor intensive. Vegetable shipments we saw were up a little bit. This is across all the vegetables. It's millions of pounds. We have to be a little careful here. I pulled out the melons because they're very heavy. Uh, so this is adding pounds of vegetables. So it, uh, uh, lettuce and spinach, uh, broccoli, celery, etc., are all in here. Uh, there's no, I don't see anything to make me think that 2020 was substantially different compared to the prior years. And if I went back a few more years, it's a little hard to make the data comparable. But if I did that, you would see a, a, basically a bunch of lines that vary a little bit from year to year. Uh, there's a, 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 occasionally a week where there's a holiday, and that's typically where you see a dip. If you're wondering about little dips here and there, it's weeks where there's holidays. Uh, here's iceberg lettuce. So now we're down to a very specific commodity shipment. Uh, we're not worried about adding pounds of one 
a commodity to another. Uh, it's it's a, a very large, uh, important vegetable for California, still 50 million pounds of it uh, being shipped. You might have thought a lot of this went to food service, but it continued. And you don't see a big change relative to 19, higher shipments relative to 19, somewhat slower, lower than 18. And again, do we see a big pandemic? No. Uh, let me skip prices. Prices are volatile. 2019 fits right into the rest of them. So in summary, uh, what I did was take the weekly data, treat each week as a data point across all these commodities I looked at, a, a couple of dozen of them, and asked, was there a significant difference? So these are the standard error of the estimate of the mean relative to the mean of the shipments of all the commodities, 2020 relative to 2018. And you say, yes, those total shipments were down by close to 13%. It is statistically significant uh, with a few hundred observations, about 250 observations, the two together, it's commodities in weeks. Uh, however, 2020 is larger than 2019, but not statistically significant. If I slice it more finely, fruits and vegetables are both down in 2020 and melons are off the charts down. down. Melons are relatively unimportant in total, except they're heavy per unit of value. So as a value crop, they're not a big deal in terms of weight, they're a much bigger, bigger deal, a lot of water. But uh, uh, vegetables are significantly up relative to 2019 and down relative to 2020. And the bottom of this chart shows you prices. And if you're an economist like me, you say, yes, uh, when, you when you ship less stuff, prices rise. When you ship more stuff, prices are lower. And that's generally what we see here. So this traces out the demand curve. This, this suggests that the supply side is not marking, mark, the supply shipments is not responding to a problem on the market side, the demand side. Uh, that, would, that would cause uh, prices and, and quantities to both fall. When prices rise, when quantities fall, it means something happened on the supply side. Uh, people had to bid more to get the uh, smaller available quantities. And that's what these data are consistent uh, with. And I'm not going to talk about the standard errors. Uh, most of the big price changes are statistically significant, even if marginally, uh, like uh, the, the uh, total price series. Some, like vegetable prices declining, are in fact uh, quite substantial vegetable price declines. So the final remarks on these produce shipments, there's uh, what I would say, very weak evidence that the shipments were much different overall. But that hypothesis is hard to confirm. I got lots of numbers, but maybe you could think of this if you're skeptical, you, you just got one data point. We've only had one economy and we only had one pandemic to look at here. I don't have the data for 20, uh, uh, excuse me, 1918. Uh, so, so we have lots of numbers. I treated the produce shipments of all these different commodities as separate data points, and every week is a separate data point in those, uh, and that's uh, troublesome. So I, I don't want to sell this too hard. Uh, this is not uh, this is not yet ready for my presentation uh, as as a refereed journal article in an economics journal. I'm not there yet with these data. The data aren't there yet. But overall, 2020 does not stand out. And I want to, and much of the difference looks like what could be caused by weather or some other normal variation. Some crops like melons, it's possible that they were left unplanted, anticipating labor to be scarce, or maybe other crops just look better. Uh, this uh, I did I haven't seen the acreage data on melon plantings yet. We'll get those data, they're just for 2020, but they're not here yet. The labor demand versus labor supply impacts, I think are hard to assess yet. On the demand side, maybe we didn't plant some fruits and vegetable crops some some berries or some vegetables. Uh, and therefore, uh, 
we didn't produce. Maybe we had labor supply impacts. For individual farms, we know one or the other applied lots of places. So I don't mean anecdotes here, I mean across uh, the uh, across the industry. Uh, for some of this data is still coming in. Let me have a few remarks about what directions are headed. These massive government transfers are probably going to continue. Uh, I don't I don't predict politics, but I haven't heard anybody at the new USDA say uh, they're anxious to cut uh, payments to anybody, let alone farmers. And there was farm money in the latest bills that went through and farm money in the latest proposals. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, the same on the trade side, by the way. I just got three or four articles uh, from people following uh, the administration and the US Trade Representative's Office and others. And for all the uh, changes between uh, 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 administrations in Washington, DC, the one thing you're not hearing is changes in trade policy. So for example, as best I can tell, none of the, what people started calling the Trump tariffs, none of the tariffs, none of the trade war uh, created over the last couple of years has been reversed. It, at least so far, the administration, the current administration has not decided to turn the corner when it came to trade. I'm a standard economist. I'm a free trade kind of guy. So that's uh, uh, worrisome from my point of view. Uh, it's a problematic path for policy in general. Uh, these payments have been made for politically powerful grievance. It may be legitimate. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to get into that. Certainly industries took big hits and they could point to the government and say these were caused by the government, either the trade disruption or the lockdowns. And, and uh, there's an argument for saying the government did it. It's like if somebody put a freeway through the side of a farm, there's a takings and the government buys the land. You could argue this is the same kind of a thing, but it does not do anything to enhance farm productivity or efficiency. Those remain public goods. That's what most people on this call uh, do for a living is try to improve productivity and efficiency and reduce environmental problems and all those sorts of things. Uh, we don't have many dollars for that. And we didn't create any dollars for that in the current pandemic. We spent a lot of dollars on agriculture, but nothing, nothing extra for uh, the overall research and, and whether it's environmental research or, or, uh, or productivity research. And the perennials like the droughts, fires, groundwater problems, infrastructure decay, regulations, trade, and on and on, those are continuing like ever. So I'm an optimistic guy We've been dealing with these sorts of things at the bottom there forever. We're still gonna deal with them. It's a challenging business. Farming is really hard. It's hard in California. It's also hard in Texas. All these issues are there. The pandemic, I would say, we got so far through without huge major disruptions and we're still dealing in a major way with all the issues that we had before it started. Let me stop there. Sorry if I uh, if uh, you couldn't hear me or couldn't and uh, you didn't miss much if you couldn't see me. Dan, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think the the strange things for most of us in research is that we all felt the impact of COVID on our research activities. Yep. Um, but really, on the farm level, it doesn't seem to have had that much of an impact um, per se. Uh, we, we got a and, and let me questions. say one thing in response to that. Sure. Every farm I know was scrambling like hell to make accommodations. Yeah. So every and so what I'm talking about is the outcome. Uh, one way to read this is people who were working day and night were actually successful. So people were scrambling. The farm workers were taking risks. They were getting sick, and yet still we got the crops harvested. So. Boy, don't don't quote me as saying it was easy. Uh, you know, I, I don't. Uh, that, it was not. Everybody I know was really working on. Yeah, um, we have uh, two questions um, that are out there. 
The first, is it possible that grape decline was a result of wildfire issues? And I think you probably already mentioned that. Yeah, the, the, that, uh, 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 if wine grapes are a different story, uh, and I don't have wine grapes on these charts, certainly uh, there was 2020 damage in wine grapes. Uh, table grapes, I think much less so, but, but correct me if I'm wrong, that, that could be right. I know table grapes were affected, uh, but at least most of the story I hear about uh, uh, the smoke damage, it was the uh, wine grapes. Yeah, the second question, uh, um, something that I've thought through a little bit too, my wife works in the health uh, system here in the Valley, and we really didn't see COVID cases really start to peak until after Thanksgiving here in the Valley, yeah. when it really got bad. So uh, the second question was, uh, do you think we'll see a ripple effect from 2020 uh, into 2021 in terms of price and shipment? Primarily because I think we may have seen a bigger impact on labor issues maybe in 2021 than we will in 2020. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, uh, you know, the, the farm worker community was affected uh, probably uh, earlier than a lot of others in the Valley. Uh, and, and we know more severely, and it was a matter of there are lots of reasons for that, probably mostly not related to the job they were doing. So the, the, I think the accommodations in the fields were, were but uh, communities and, and poverty and, and those sort of issues in the Valley for the Hispanic community, broadly speaking, in the farm labor community. But I have not seen data, up-to-date data, uh, bringing uh, labor, for example, and, and uh, uh, produce. Uh, we didn't see it in, in end of year produce shipments, but you're exactly right. We may have problems uh, as we get into 2021. Fortunately for much of the Valley harvested uh, uh, crops, uh, it will be uh, Central Valley harvested crops. It will be uh, later in the year when, when a lot of that is harvested. The harvested crops right now, of course, berries are going strong uh, in, here in California. So shipments of, uh, of the produce items, Imperial, for example, uh, shipments. And, and we'll be watching those very closely. That's a very good point that, that labor uh, problems uh, may have hit a little bit later as the pandemic spread more widely. Mm -hmm. It's certainly true in Arizona. The re reports out of Arizona are just terrible on that score. We, got, uh, we have a little bit of time for any other questions if anybody would like to post something in the Q&A. I'm not sure, I, I see a lot of things in chat, but I don't know if any of those are Q&A. So I, I'm not gonna look at them, but- uh, uh, Yeah, I don't think anything in the chat has been okay, a question good. directed at you. So I am open to questions, but it, there's no problem getting this program. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure plenty of people can use the, the extra five minutes. Uh, Dan, I guess another question might be, um, you know, the, the impact doesn't seem to be as great in the U.S. as maybe a lot of us thought may have happened. Uh, worldwide, is it about the same? Uh, worldwide agriculture data lags, uh, and oh. I haven't seen it. So, so I, I can't tell you. Uh, the, the place where we'll have good data is Europe, but I don't know that they have... Um, this sort of, uh, they don't have as good a farm income data as we have generally. And I don't know that they have, I don't know the produce shipment data there. Yeah. Uh, the, the US uh, through the Agricultural Marketing uh, Service does a pretty good job uh, of tracking produce shipments here, here around the U US. I've done work on trade, the trade data lags a couple of months um, and, and uh, uh, world exports of agricultural products are, are mostly, as you'd expect, uh, here in North America, we ship produce back and forth between Mexico and the U.S., uh, the U.S. to Canada, the U.S. to Mexico, for that matter. So we do a lot of shipment. In Europe, there's a lot of shipments within Europe, but the big trade numbers that I've seen are the, the basic grains and the like. The value of trade was down because grain prices were down through the middle of the year, but grain prices are way up now. And, and, uh, and China has uh, picked up in their imports of grain 
and, uh, and oil seeds as their livestock industry has come back. Basically, uh, 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 agricultural scientists are used to looking at pandemics. Uh, we usually think of them as phytosanitary or sanitary issues in the sense of uh, plant disease or animal disease. We're, we're very familiar with that. And of course, last year, the biggest one in, in world agriculture was the pork disease. That is until March. We, and we were all worried about uh, African swine fever and what that meant to pork uh, and corn and soybean uh, trade. But that has faded away, at least from our consciousness, if not in reality. We've got time for one more question. And then, uh, Dan, I'll ask you to answer the other question. But um, what role did logistics play versus labor or demand getting yeah. products to destination? Uh, the, the biggest problem was the destinations changed. So, you know, we know there was produce fields plowed under because somebody had planted something specifically for a set of restaurants in LA and then they were closed. So it was where you could ship them and, and then packaging. So you have a whole bunch of cartons of milk and eight ounce cartons ready to go to school lunch. Now, what do you do? Or you have uh, 50 gallon bags to go into restaurants into their uh, coffee server, uh, coffee and milk uh, uh, service. So those were the biggest logistic problem in terms of, as I understand it, in terms of trucking and those sort of issues that hasn't, that wasn't the major disruption. Now, over the last two months, what we've had is a port disruption because of a lack of containers. So some of you that are looking at international trade, the Chinese economy has grown, other places not. We used to have this very cheap backhaul. Uh, containers came from China filled with toys, went or miscellaneous stuff, and went back to China filled with California uh, products, uh, often packaged uh, agricultural products, including dairy products. And now uh, a lot of those containers are shipped in and out of China, but never get to the West Coast, or some of them are going back empty just so they can get there more quickly because the export market there is booming. And so the disruption we've had right now, the one we're facing is, is this odd port issue of having very expensive containers where they used to be really cheap. Dan, thanks. I really appreciate you giving us an update uh, or an overview of COVID-19 impact, especially here in California. Um, it's Easy interesting. to find if you have questions, send me an email. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. See you later, everybody. So it's nine o'clock and we're uh, moving into our first session uh, for this Monday morning, and that's uh, automation in agriculture. And um, this is an issue that I think has been on a lot of people's mind for a while, especially considering uh, labor issues that we find here in California. And, um, you know, the real challenges of trying to create automation to um, help deal with our labor shortages. Um, you know, the, this, the odd thing about automation is the best robot we have right now happens to walk on two legs. Um, people's ability to be able to discern the ripeness of a piece of fruit or vegetable, be able to pick it quickly, be able to handle it, get a feel for it and deal with it, either put it into a box or discard it because of how it feels or how it looks or how it smells um, is, is going to be a big, big challenge in the future, I think, for our robotics people to, to work through. Um, and just even uh, some standard practices and fields, uh, getting that to be automated, I think, um, it still remains a bit of a challenge. Uh, a lot of people think that farmers don't use automation very much or don't use technology very much. And I can assure you that if you go into the Midwest now, uh, with all the gizmos and gears you find on tractors now and the automation that's on tractors and in harvesting, there's a lot of technology being used. Um, the difficulty here in California is that most of our crops are extremely labor intensive and that um, provides different challenges 
um, for automation. Um, it's relatively easy now to put a GPS on a tractor and create uh, GPS level maps on a farm. Um, it's relatively easy to put yield monitors on the on your combine and from that create yield maps of your farm so that you can identify areas on your farm that uh, you uh, areas in your farm that you need to go out and maybe take special care of to try and increase the yields of those uh, particular areas uh, because of specific issues. So a lot of this kind of technology is being used and being um, utilized uh, throughout agriculture here in the United States. Um, but there are really some promising new technologies coming on board uh, in the future. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about automation in agriculture and, and where this is going and what that might look like in the future. Um, I'd like to introduce our first um, speaker for the morning. Um, Elia is in the Department of Environmental Sciences at UC Riverside, and uh, she'll be talking to us about the challenges and opportunities for artificial intelligent, intelligence and automation in the U.S. Southwest. Good morning. Good morning, everybody from uh, uh, Riverside. I'm uh, going to um, share my slides real quick. Um, and uh, let's see if we can go from there. Okay, so... Oh, there you go. You're so, go. Uh, what, 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 sorry, Sherry? Sorry, you're good to go. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, as I said, from uh, Riverside, I'm uh, Elias Cudiero. I'm a faculty at the Environmental Science Department here, but I also have a, a joint appointment with the U.S. Salinity Laboratory, which is also in here in Riverside. And I'm uh, um, here to give a, a soil scientist perspective on uh, uh, sense challenges and opportunities for the use of uh, AI and automation in the US Southwest. So briefly, before we uh, go on with the uh, talk, I'm just gonna talk briefly about what we do in my lab, uh, the Digital Agronomy Lab here at UC Riverside. And we are a small team that are looking at uh, near ground and remote sensing uh, measurements of uh, uh, plant and soils for uh, mostly for mapping and monitoring such systems. Then we uh, use models that can capture the uh, spatial and temporal relationships between plant, soil, and environments across across different scales. And then we use try to use this knowledge in uh, the precision agriculture uh, field. Currently, I'm uh, uh, leading a large multi-scale, uh, multi-state project on AI for sustainable water, nutrient, uh, salinity, and pest management in the U.S. So today, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a. Uh, um, uh, research uh, um, report or, or, or show some of the research that we are doing on the soil science part of this project, but as well uh, talk about what we uh, learn about this field, especially after our conversations with the stakeholders and other members of the ag tech sector or the agriculture sector in general uh, in this uh, uh, initial part of the project that just uh, started a few months ago. Uh, so today we we'll, like briefly go over what uh, automation and artificial intelligence uh, can uh, do for agriculture and uh, um, talk a little bit about uh, the research uh, challenges of uh, capturing soil spatial variability and then uh, uh, conclude by talking a little bit about uh, what uh, challenges and opportunities are there in digital agriculture for research and education. So when uh, people talk about, uh, excuse me, people talk about Yes, there we go. Um, Agro automation, maybe they tend to think about uh, robots doing all the work while growers sit uh, on the side of the field and uh, enjoy, enjoy the view. Uh, so of course, automation includes the robots, but also uh, this it refers to any technology that really is used to monitor and control the crop and uh, livestock production in an in a automated way. So re uh, removing as much as possible the, the input and uh, labor from, uh, from humans. Uh, so these uh, includes, of course, uh, robots that are uh, in the field doing specific uh, uh, tasks uh, and uh, operate independently, uh, but as well, more comprehensively, it includes uh, a wide landscape of technologies, uh, such as uh, advanced sensing of uh, um, crops, soil and, and uh, environmental processes, um, the use of uh, data science tools to accurately characterize uh, egg systems. And then the Internet of Things that connects software and hardware and make these uh, um, 
uh, information and decision support tools easily accessible to the growers that have like decision uh, making power, but then as well streamlines this information to the uh, field machinery that are in the field to do uh, uh, the actual management and as well the uh, equipments that are uh, implementing uh, management at the, at the in the field. So um, I'm going. I'm showing here uh, the a table uh, created by Better Food Ventures. Uh, they prepare this table yearly and present all companies that are entering the uh, ag tech sector. And uh, in the recent years, we had like a, a drastic increase of uh, ag tech companies uh, working uh, uh, more and more to support uh, uh, growers uh, in the US. Most of the companies still work in the um, uh, digital agronomy and production side of agriculture, but more and more are also uh, serving uh, farmers by uh, supporting other aspects of, of agriculture. So this uh, landscape is very broad uh, and uh, uh, there's a more and more exciting stuff going on from the, from the private sector. And uh, as many times happened with technology, uh, the uh, um, sometimes technology is, uh, is more advanced than, uh, than what the science is. So uh, we need to, as, as, as a community, to uh, provide the science to back up this, uh, the use of this, these technologies and uh, make sure that they are used in the most uh, effective way. Um, so when we're looking at uh, uh, the needs for uh, agricultural systems, we, uh, most of us know that we are projected to reach 9.7 billion by 2015. Uh, and this would need to increase uh, agricultural production by 70%. And uh, several analyses show that uh, a better use uh, of uh, fertilizer or uh, irrigation uh, uh, management, uh, soil management, and other precision technologies can actually help us reach these uh, yield goals that we have from uh, for 2050. Uh, um, we are lucky that uh, actually we are uh, advancing pretty rapidly in the uh, use of technology to support uh, this uh, uh, um, aim of reaching uh, higher yield goals, uh, because there's a rapid expansion uh, and, uh, of development and availability of uh, technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence, hardware and software uh, uh, that are also uh, that are all connected through the Internet of Things. So we can refer as this entire uh, discipline as digital agriculture. And digital ag as uh, the promise to be able to tailor management to address uh, dynamic and localized needs of agriculture. So we are uh, going to try to shift um, a generalized management of farm resources from this uh, homogeneous management and generalized management to uh, highly tailored, optimized, site and, site and time specific and uh, real time uh, type of managements that are actuated via automated systems that use an integration of field and remote sensing and artificial intelligence to inform management. So in this context, uh, artificial intelligence can help optimize uh, farm management while considering the trade-offs between different sustainability aspects. And so the question is, if we can use AI and this automated system to help us reach the USA long-term sustainable agricultural goals. Uh, for example, we can decide to optimize field scale profitability while reducing at the same, scale, uh, the same um, time regional scale environmental impacts. Uh, so going to the study that we are doing uh, with this multi-state project, we're looking at uh, uh, agriculture in the um, uh, U.S. Southwest, looking at the Colorado River Basin and Salinas River Valley, which are very important for the uh, U.S. economy. But uh, uh, there are several challenges, including droughts, soil and water degradation, uh, pre pressure from weed pathogen and insects that are uh, uh, affecting the system. Therefore, there are needs for a more parsimonious use of natural resources and as well, real-time monitoring of the agricultural system as a whole. So the research opportunity that is there uh, is to see if artificial intelligence can provide a monitoring and decision support framework that can lay a foundation for a long-term shift to highly automated uh, farm management systems, while this, uh, in the short and, and medium term improve uh, currently used technologies. So, in the soil 
portion of uh, our research, uh, we are looking at creating uh, accurate high resolution soil maps. And we start with the availability of uh, soil data from uh, USDA and RCS uh, that is available through the uh, web soil survey. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, these um, the maps generally are very accurate at uh, representing broad scale processes, uh, but for informing um, automated systems and uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence models, we need this information to be as accurate as possible at uh, shorter spatial scales. So we uh, first uh, recently used uh, uh, data uh, collected by UCR colleagues, uh, US, uh, US Salinity Labs and Fresno State University in the past uh, uh, 20 years or so uh, uh, across uh, Central and, and Southern California. And we use data set collected of uh, uh, saturation percentage of the soil, which is a, a good proxy for uh, clay content and, uh, and other uh, particle size fraction uh, um, properties. And we can see that uh, the field average saturation percentage measure in uh, the, uh, almost 100 fields correlates very well with the, the field average uh, clay content reported by Sergo. And this is the same for uh, the other particle size fractions. Um, However, though, um, this is a, a, good, a good, uh, um, good thing that we can capture the average uh, uh, field scale properties, but to inform uh, AI and, uh, and automation, we might need to have even better information at the subfield scale. So um, in recent years, there are been several attempts to try to create high resolution products for, uh, for um, uh, soil maps across the US and globally. And here's, there are three remarkable examples of these. And in general, uh, these models uh, are built differently, but uh, in general, they um, leverage the data available from uh, NRCS uh, and other public data sets. So like uh, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of, of ground uh, measurements. And they use uh, um, remote sensing and other uh, spatial covariates through uh, machine learning models to try to estimate uh, um, uh, soil properties over grids uh, of different spatial resolutions. Uh, we use our data set of, of, of almost 100 fields uh, in California to uh, evaluate these maps. And we found out that these uh, uh, Polaris soil property maps from uh, Cheney et al are the most accurate uh, uh, for uh, over our um, fields that we measure. But still, uh, you can see that there's quite an error between what we measure in the field as uh, in terms of uh, average saturation percentage and what the field average reported by these maps are. So there's quite a bit of, uh, of error at the field scale still. And uh, in general, uh, the limitations of these broad scale digital soil maps is that uh, often they are successfully capturing this regional and landscape scale uh, soil spatial variability, but they do not capture the local scale variability very accurately. So uh, challenges there are to increase the local accuracy using uh, high resolution measurements from uh, near ground and remote sensors, but as well develop new uh, generations of algorithms that uh, uh, can uh, uh, provide real time uh, uh, estimation of soil spatial variability via integration of uh, uh, sensing at different scales. So what uh, we've seen in the in the past is that uh, uh, the use of uh, soil sensors uh, such as uh, electrical conductivity, gamma ray, optical sensors, and such uh, uh, are very successful at uh, uh, representing field scale soil spatial variability. And these ad hoc surveys can be, uh, uh, however, very expensive, uh, time consuming, and require a substantial expertise for data acquisition and inter interpretation. Uh, however, though, we are uh, going through a new gen uh, iteration, new generation of, uh, of the use of these sensors when they are being embedded into field equipment uh, that uh, allow for routine sensor measurements while uh, other day-to-day uh, -day operations are carried out by this field equipment. And uh, with the uh, current advancement of uh, machine learning, we can uh, take this data that are that is uh, automatically uh, um, uh, acquired by, by 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 film machinery and then interpret it by uh, and by doing so we minimize the need for human interpretation. So some example of of this uh, 
this concept is uh, when we have a field equipment that is out in the field doing uh, tradition, like day-to-day -day soil tasks, such as uh, tillage, seeding, fertilization, spraying, uh, pruning, uh, measuring, uh, 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 or, or doing other other day-to-day -day tasks, they can have embedded sensors that can measure soil, plant, and environmental parameters, such as micro elevation. Uh, soil uh, uh, sensing that can be then used to determine physical and chemical properties, uh, do computer vision to identify weeds that need to be plucked uh, from uh, or, or, or sprayed, uh, and so on. So the idea here is that the more uh, data that we collect from these uh, uh, sensors, the, the better inform the traditional field task will be, and so on, the, like one of the, the, the be, be, better measurements that we uh, we collect the the, the, the best uh, management we can uh, carry out uh, consequently. So uh, we are reaching a point when we soon we're going to have uh, uh, soil sensing uh, carried out at uh, thousands and thousands of uh, of fields uh, by uh, fleets of uh, of tractors and. Uh, therefore, we can analyze these very large data sets with understanding that most often what we measure from soil sensing is uh, related to uh, what the soil target property is, but there's also an influence of a spatial random error. But the idea here is that when we have thousands and thousands of fields, we can look at the entire data set and try to uh, uh, have a best estimation of what the real relationship between a, a uh, the sensor measurement and the target property is. And then we can understand how to use other data to uh, remove the effect of uh, uh, local spatial errors that are uh, uh, deviating this relationship from what uh, we should uh, expect from, uh, from the sensor measurements. So in the example of soil mapping for clay, we could have a, a target variable such as clay content and uh, use a primary set of predictor to understand what uh, the relationship between uh, remote or proximal sensing is with, uh, at the regional scale or global scale, and then use a secondary set of predictors to uh, adjust this uh, uh, relationship to estimate local deviation from the overall relationship. So one of the uh, straightforward implementation of this is uh, uh, models based on analysis of covariance. Um, developed, uh, presented by Corwin and Lesh uh, in 2014, where you have a global regression slope between a soil sensor measurement and a target soil property. And then this relationship is adjusted at the field uh, scale level to, uh, uh, to uh, give uh, higher accuracy measurements. And an example, uh, this works very well in a variety of sensors. And there's, and there's an example here for the use of uh, apparent electrical conductivity to estimate soil saturation percentage over the data set that I presented earlier and with a few more fields added to it. Um, so we have a very uh, noise relationship uh, when we just look at it, but when we apply these models that uh, represents a relationship at different uh, scales, we can have much uh, more accurate uh, predictions. So the work that uh, uh, Mario Guevara, that is a postdoc in our lab is doing at the moment uh, is uh, to use these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, historical data set or data set previously acquired to uh, uh, in better inform calibrations at new fields that uh, whenever data comes in and you so you would have like a data from the uh, soil sensors and then you can uh, see how well you're doing by collecting as well soil uh, physical uh, uh, samples and, uh, and analyze them at the lab. So th this automated process for, for sensor calibration would go through uh, different steps. And so first you would harmonize the data sets, then you would uh, explore the data sets and then towards other set steps of dividing and interpreting the data set, you could uh, develop different uh, machine learning models that can help you predict the target soil property at the field scale and also give you an information of how much uncertainty is associated to that prediction. So once you have these high resolution soil maps, you can use them for several purposes, such as inform regional scale models, but at the same time, direct field uh, scale management. And one of the uh, um, uh, applications that I'm most interested on is the use of these uh, soil maps to direct variable rate irrigation. And um, so from these maps, you can calculate how much uh, uh, soil available water uh, or, or holding capacity a soil has. And then you can divide the soil in different uh, the fields in different uh, portions so that have different uh, common soil properties. And there are several commercial applications to these uh, that go from pivot irrigation to uh, lateral move and uh, 
uh, even drip uh, irrigation systems. And there are several commercial products that are currently allowing growers to automate most of the process uh, where the growers just have to agree uh, on a, 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 an application of water through their smartphone apps. So I'm not gonna talk too much about it. There's a very interesting uh, uh, talk uh, tomorrow by Raj Kozla on this exact topic. So I'm just gonna move on and, uh, and uh, conclude this presentation. Uh, by uh, talking about uh, some barriers to adoption of automation and precision technology uh, that we got from feedback from uh, growers and neck tech industries and other ex stakeholders. So as uh, um, uh, we were mentioning earlier uh, uh, before my talk that, that these uh, technologies are getting um, uh, adopted more and more by growers, but still uh, there is uh, some uh, barriers for uh, broad scale uh, uh, application, especially in uh, uh, the US Southwest that has a, a much more heterogeneous uh, uh, crop uh, system that, uh, that, than the Midwest does. So the growers uh, are in the US are really committed to, to maintaining soil, water, and other natural resources, uh, while at the same time uh, sustaining the economic output of, the, of their farm operations. Uh, so they are very interested in uh, uh, using this technology, and, uh, uh, and they are very interested in uh, uh, improving the, 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 the levels of technology used in their day-to-day in their, uh, -day operations. Uh, however, switching to uh, automations, either in equipment or, or decision support tools, requires a considerable economic con commitment. And so um, uh, the question that most often uh, are, are posed is that uh, uh, this is uh, very expensive, so like there's a doubt if you will pay off. And uh, this uh, uh, is an answer that needs to be uh, looked site specifically because uh, technologies, uh, 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 different technologies might work in different uh, areas with or different cropping systems. So we, uh, there's a need to assess uh, this uh, feasibility at the, at the site uh, specifically for, it, for each farmer. So there's a, um, a research that is needed to therefore increase the knowledge of ag systems at all relevant spatial and temporal scales. And as a, a research community, we should focus on all aspects of sustainability uh, so we could complement the effort of the, of the tech industry that mostly tends to focus on uh, uh, agricultural profits. Um, and then uh, we need to uh, understand the feasibility and the cost effectiveness of uh, specific technologies across diverse geographical regions and cropping systems, uh, which is a knowledge that is not there at the moment. And then uh, as scientists, we need to further develop uh, sensing measurements that matter. So uh, there's a need for new sensing technologies and platforms. And as well, investigate uh, the full potential of machine learning and AI to uh, do integration of sensor, uh, use uh, data with the, the use big, big, big data available from uh, uh, public uh, uh, repository and uh, private institutions. Uh, and, and as well, do real-time data analytics so that then we can uh, develop no novel ways of distilling actionable information from uh, otherwise uh, uh, data sets that are very noisy. So um, at, a, at the same time for the indigenous side, there's a need to develop better uh, tractors, irrigation systems and so on. Um, and then at the same time, software, hardware, equipment integration that can be easily to uh, be interpreted by the growers and as well easily maintained in the field. And then as well, uh, there's a need for seamless real-time networking through the Internet of Things. So concluding, uh, there's also a gap in education because uh, there's a fewer and fewer people going into uh, the agricultural sector. So this uh, uh, ag tech uh, revolution can create a, a, a opportunities for, for young people to uh, find fulfilling careers in, uh, um, in agriculture. Uh, but there's a need for us to educate the future leaders of uh, these ag new agricultural sectors. And, and this would be by integrating uh, curricula or engineering computer science with the uh, ag and environmental sciences that uh, focus on traditional learning, experiential learning, and as well collaboration with the ag tech industry. So as a final remarks, um, uh, we saw how digital agriculture promises to tailor uh, management to address dynamic localized needs. Uh, USDA long-term agriculture uh, uh, goals for economic, environment, and social sustainability might be met by the use of, uh, of, of these technologies, but there's a much work needed to improve it, expand uh, uh, our understanding of the systems, and then integrate this knowledge with tools uh, that the farmers used. 
And then, uh, of, of course, uh, the need of, uh, for novel partnerships between scientists, ag tech industry, and growers to make sure that uh, we meet uh, jointly the uh, um, objectives uh, for agriculture in the next 30 years or so. So this, uh, this was my presentation for today. Thanks for your attention. Uh, you can contact me to get any more detail about what we are doing. And here's uh, an acknowledgement of the sources that are funding our research at the moment. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Uh, there's a couple in the uh, Q&A. So I'll have you just answer the second question. But the first question is, uh, to what extent can vegetative uh, vegetation and soil brightness images be useful to determine productivity and management zones along with sampling? Uh, can vegetation and soil brightness be useful? So uh, there, there's always uh, uh, a need of integration of, uh, um, to, in my, my experience of integration of uh, um, soil information with, uh, uh, with um, uh, crop information, because crop information by itself doesn't uh, give you a precise uh, um, um, interpretation of what's going on. Uh, so could, like any deviation from optimal uh, vegetation index ranges could uh, uh, be due to different uh, biotic or abiotic stressors. So through uh, understanding the relationship between soil and, uh, and, and those measurements, you can uh, uh, infer what's going on with the, with the, uh, with the plant if and what levels of uh, soil uh, induced stress that you're, you're, you're looking at or if you're looking at soil induced stress at all as well. So always integrate data from uh, uh, multiple aspects to get a more comprehensive understanding of what's going on. Great. Um, if you wouldn't mind answering the other question, uh, I think you can type the answer. I think you can see it. Yeah, I can. I can. I can. Uh, so uh, for for we are actually looking at these uh, comparing multiple probes at the moment. So like uh, I don't have a definitive answer, but uh, you, uh, people can contact me via email to uh, to learn more because I don't want to uh, give like in such short time uh, advice of any specific commercial probe because uh, uh, that's not really what I want to do here. Right. So I I think uh, for this anonymous attendee who asked this question if they just yeah. get a hold uh, can go through the email address and just uh, right here. do a d discussion offline thank you i appreciate it uh, thanks have a good have a good day move, thanks we'll move on to our second presentation stavros from the department of biological and ag engineering at uc davis and it's going to be talking about engineering robotic harvest aid technologies well stavros Thank you very much. Let me share my screen and make sure that uh, everybody can see it. Does that look good? Yeah, I may interrupt you if you start breaking up. Um, we've been having a little bit of problem with people breaking up and we just ask you to turn off your uh, video. That seems to be helping. Okay. Uh, so if I stop my video, you will be showing the slides yourself. No, no, Stavros, just go ahead. We'll, we'll work on it. We'll, okay, maybe up, we'll tell you. Okay, so um, um, thank you for the invitation to present. My name is Stavros Vujukas. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of California, Davis. Uh, my home department is biological and uh, ag engineering. And today's topic is going to be robotic harvest aid technologies. So um, I'm I'm directing the bioautomation lab, and we do a lot of work in robotic harvest aids, but also in mechanical and robotic harvesting in general for fruits, uh, and some core technologies in autonomous navigation in orchards, um, data collection uh, based on, on workers' activities, and then some post-harvest automation. Today, I will focus on robotic harvest aids. So. Uh, you know, everybody's reading in the news and, and we know about the robotic harvesters uh, for harvesting apples mainly. Uh, also, there is a lot of work done for strawberries, uh, kiwis in New Zealand. Uh, and, and these are machines that are pretty high tech and they're, they seem to be working in general, but the issue is that still the um, efficiency and the speed of those machines hasn't reached the stage where they are already commercially available and, and cost effective. And also they, uh, they require, for example, trees that, are, um, that have been groomed 
and uh, you know they're of, of a specific canopy architecture and so it's not clear whether those technologies will be uh, readily available for a lot of different fruits and, 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 and vegetables even. And also when that happens, still their efficiency is not gonna reach 100%, which means that the fruits that are difficult to reach or are not even, even visible, uh, they will require manual picking. And so uh, people are gonna be here for quite some time. And that's why the technology of robotic harvest aids uh, constitutes a, a near to medium term solution for harvesting. So today I will present uh, uh, technologies that my lab has developed for strawberries and tree fruits. Uh, the, first, the first technology relates to strawberry harvesting. And this is a video of um, workers harvesting strawberries uh, as you can see, they're dispersed in the field. They are putting the strawberries in trays and then they rush outside because they're getting paid the piece rate to carry the full trays and then uh, rush back to resume picking. And according to our own measurements, about 10 to 20% of their time is simply spent walking or running in some cases. And although picking is very difficult, it's very challenging from a perception and dexterity point of view, walking and transporting trays should not be that complicated. So it's kind of a, a the low hanging fruit for us. So we decided that we want to build a better system to, uh, to do that. Um, of course, there are other approaches. This is a, a standard a large harvester or conveyor where many pickers walk behind the huge machine and harvest. Um, the issue with these machines is that they are not cheap. They're, they're, they're expensive. Uh, they're also very large, so it's difficult to deploy them or, or sometimes even turn them. They require very long rows to be um, efficient. And also the slow pickers and the faster pickers have to work with the same machine. That creates issues uh, in the crew and sometimes the slowest person becomes a bottleneck. And so uh, we took a different approach. We envisioned that we could develop robots that carry trays in the field. Um, and this is uh, an example of, of this approach. As you can see, a picker has finished picking. Uh, a robot is in front of them. They're, they're putting their tray on the robot, pushing a button, robot goes away. So they don't have to walk all the distance, which in this case is not very long for the particular worker, but it can be up to 200 or 300 feet away until you reach the, the edge of the field. And so this is an example of, of a robot that's autonomous. Actually, it's not one. You can see there is another robot here and the two of them are totally coordinated and they are serving pickers. Essentially they are going to a picker when the picker needs to uh, transport the tray and they do the transportation for them. And, and so let's take a look at another video that shows in, in fast motion what these robots do. Basically all day they go back and forth and they just carry trays around. And you know, looking at it, it seems like a relatively simple task uh, but actually there's a lot of technology um, embedded in it because you know the question is how does a robot know where to go and when to go to a picker of course they cannot guess they need information and we also need to make it very easy for the picker to use those robots simply you know put their tray on the robot and nothing else no no other um, complicated interaction so the way this works is that, as you may be aware, uh, strawberry pickers use what they call carito. It's a small wireframe cart where they put their tray on so that it's held above the ground in a nice position uh, and they can move forward as they pick and push the cart. Well, we instrumented this cart with electronics, load sensors that measure the yield GPS position, we know where the picker is, uh, a clock, a real-time clock, so we know exactly how fast they're picking, 
where they are. And because this carito that you see here measures the weight of the strawberries, and we know the capacity of the tray, we can predict, or the robots predict actually, when the picker will be done, because maybe there are somewhere here and they will take another minute or so, and also where they will be. And that information is transmitted wirelessly to the robots. And then the robots, uh, uh, they have some kind of scheduling algorithms that, um, that decide which picker to go to and when to go to the picker. Now, we tested those robots uh, in Lompoc in a, in a California a strawberry field uh, during November, which is low season actually. And I wanted to share some of the results here. Uh, you can see here on the right, manual harvesting. Uh, they spent 77.3% of their time picking and 22.7 walking. With the robots, the 77% uh, went up into an 89.2. So we saw a 12 increase, 12% 12 increase in efficiency by using the machines. However, if the experiments are done in, in late uh, spring or, or, or summer, when the load of fruits is much heavier, the yield, then we expect based on our data and our simulations that the jump in efficiency may reach even to 20 or 25%. So uh, uh, this is an example of robotic harvest aids increasing efficiency. Um, another side effect, if you will, of this is that we can generate very accurate yield maps of the strawberries because we know how much is picked uh, per unit time and per unit distance by whom and we can generate those yields uh, every time they pick the same field so they can track the, uh, the yield, but also manage their labor better. Definitely an issue with robotic harvest aids is making sure we attend to ergonomics because these machines allow the picker to be 100% efficient. That's not good for them because they need also to walk and change posture because picking strawberries in a stoop position is not really uh, good for you if you do it for hours, you need to take breaks. And so uh, it is possible with these systems to incorporate ergonomics. For example, if somebody has been working for more than 20 minutes or 25 minutes, the robot may signal to them that I'm not coming to you or I'm stopping you know, 50 feet or 100 feet away from you so that I force you to walk. Um, also, if you don't want the robot to come, you can you know, push a button and, and reject their service. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it really needs to be figured out what's the best uh, user interface and what's the best way to utilize the robots, but the technology allows efficiencies that can be pretty high. Uh, second example is a similar example. It's a harvest aid, but now it's not strawberries. And by the way, strawberries could be raspberries, blackberries, uh, table grapes. They all have the same uh, challenge with transporting uh, fruits. But this example is about uh, tree fruits. And so <clears throat> you're probably aware of the way we harvest fruits. Like we, we use tall ladders, big bags, people climb up, reposition their ladder all the time, uh, go up and down. And then when the bag is full, they walk to the bean, the beans are scattered in the orchard and um, unload. So this is really labor intensive. It is risky because of the height of the ladders and it's also inefficient. Uh, of course, there is a lot of uh, um, equipment out there. Uh, these are orchard platforms that are used as harvest aids. Typically, you have four to six people on a multi-deck, on, on the multi-level deck. Typically, those decks are at preset heights, although sometimes the, uh, the decks go up and down. And, and, and these platforms eliminate ladders and walking. So in efficiency can increase significantly, which is a great thing. Uh, however, there are still some issues with the platforms. Uh, when the pickers stand at preset heights, 
what they do is what we call fixed zone uh, harvesting. So uh, the picker who is, for example, at the top, uh, she or he is picking the upper, the higher zone, and the picker at the bottom is picking the lower zone. And those zones overlap typically. However, this can be a problem. And this can be a problem for, for a couple of reasons. One is the distribution of fruit in the canopy is not uniform. And actually it is not uniform as you move along the row, but also it's not uniform as you go from lower to higher elevation in the canopy. This is an example of an actual fruit distribution in an apple orchard in Lodi, uh, California, uh, vitrellist orchard. And you can see there is not a lot of fruit here. There is a lot of fruit here and it varies. So now the bottom picker and the top picker, they face different fruit loads to pick, right? Uh, also, the individual picker speeds are different. Everybody has different abilities and expertise and they get tired. So their, their picking speed varies over time. So this is one issue, the mismatch between uh, fruit load and, and picker speeds. The other issue is that uh, as the platform moves along the row and we think of incoming fruits as the demand for labor and picker speed as the labor supply, uh, the, the mismatch between uh, fruit densities and picking speeds essentially creates a mismatch between labor demand and labor supply in each of those zones. The bottom line result is that this reduces the machine's harvesting speed because a picker may be idle and another picker may be too busy. And so this mismatch creates uh, inefficiencies. Those have been measured to be even 22% uh, high. So, so they introduce a lot of delay. Another issue is that in reality, the platform speed, the travel speed should match the fruit load and the picker speeds. If there is a lot of fruit to pick, the platform should be moving slowly. If there is not a lot of fruit, the platform should be going faster. Well, with today's machines, uh, this platform speed control is manual. Actually, one of the front pickers adjusts intermittently the speed by using a, a joystick, a lever or something. And that creates problems. First of all, the picker wastes time instead of picking their driving, but also they are not perfect. And so the speed control is not perfect, which again reduces the harvesting speed of the machine. So our project did the following. It basically built a better core robotic harvest aid platform. What you see here is a standard platform, uh, and I will, I will show which one it was. We um, introduced hydraulic cylinders here. So we now have, you see the cylinder here and here, and these are decks that are going up or down. So these two decks can go up and down. And so the, the pickers on the decks can move up and down but how they move up and down is controlled by a computer. Also, the speed of the platform forward is controlled by a computer. How does the computer control that? Why, how does it know how to do it? Well, there is a camera in front of the platform that estimates how much fruit there is and actually builds a fruit map. It's like a heat map that shows where there is a lot of fruit, where there is less fruit, but it shows that to the computer. The computer now knows how much fruit is incoming from the front of the orchard towards the platform as the platform is moving forward. Uh, this project was a collaboration of UC Davis and Carnegie Mellon. They provided the camera and we built the, uh, the platform and the other sensing systems. And so once we have a fruit map, we also build uh, some sensors to calculate how fast people are picking and the computer controls the lifts, but also controls the speed. 
Uh, this is the overall architecture of the system. There is a GPS. This is the 3D camera. This is the picking bag that we at UC Davis um, retrofitted with some electronics so that we can measure in real time the, the weight of the apples or the fruits that are being picked. So all of that information, the, uh, the information of the, the fruit map, this is the, the density of fruits here, the information about picking speeds and the information about position and speed, all of this goes into some special software that optimizes the speed and the elevation of the lifts. The objective is to maximize the harvest speed. This is a picture of um, a platform. It's from uh, Bandit Express. It's uh, uh, from Automated Ag, I'm sorry. It's the Bandit Express model. Uh, these are retrofitted uh, uh, hydraulic cylinders here, the left and the right. This controls the rear lift. This controls the top, the, the front lift. Uh, these are the picking bags, the pickers, uh, GPS system, and 3D camera. So we did some um, experiments during commercial uh, harvesting of vitrellist Fuji trees in Lodi. We had two pickers harvesting only from one side of the platform. Due to budget constraints, uh, we only retrofitted the right side of the platform, not both sides. And we harvested in two different modes. One was the full core robotic mode when the system is automatic. The other is conventional mode only with human, uh, uh, with human control of the speed and fixed height. This is the amount of apple that we, uh, we harvested. Uh, this is 1,800 kilograms. This is 1.4 uh, uh, thousand kilograms. And we also harvested in total about three tons of apples in, in one week. We also did two types of picking, clipping stems, not clipping stems. This is uh, a video uh, that shows what the platform looks like. I will turn down the volume. This is the 3D camera here that generates the heat map, the fruit density. Uh, this is just a gas generator for power, for the electronics. You can see here the feet of the front picker, and this is the lift now coming down. This is controlled by the computer. Also, the speed of the platform is modulated by the computer going faster and slower. And this here in the back, you can see the, uh, the legs of the rear picker as the platform is moving forward. And it, it's going up and down. And this is happening throughout the row. So what were the results? Well, um, in a nutshell, uh, the results are shown here. So when, when we did um, our clipping experiment, so when the pickers were picking and clipping the stems, it was interesting that the rear picker was much faster. He was picking faster uh, and the front picker was picking slower, maybe because he was not as experienced in, in uh, clipping. The uh, total speed of the platform was 235 kilograms per hour. However, when we, uh, when we operated in co-robotic mode, you can see that the, the, the two speeds of the pickers became closer to each other. So the algorithm balanced the, the workload and the overall speed increased by 11.3%. So we saw an 11.3% increase in harvesting speed for the machine. Now, when we were not clipping, the pickers were much faster because of course they didn't spend time clipping and they were equally fast uh, at about 400 kilograms per hour. When we tried core robotic mode, which is the computer running the show, driving as fast or as slow as it needed to and, and lifting the pickers, you can see that we went up from 400 kilograms per hour to 500 kilograms per hour for an increase in efficiency of 26%. That's, that's a pretty significant number. 
Of course, this was, uh, this was an experiment that was only one season. Uh, so what are the, uh, what is the take home message here? Well, intelligent control of travel speed and lift heights can increase the harvesting speed of the platform. We, we demonstrated that. Uh, and the main concepts here are that you're trying to load balance the workload of the pickers, which cannot be done manually. You need a computer to do that. Uh, this technology is applicable to platforms with vacuum fruit conveyance systems that are coming now in the market. There is no difference here. And they're also applicable to multi-arm robotic harvesters, like some of the new harvesting machines. Because there, again, when you have multiple arms, you have to do load balancing. Otherwise, some of them are idle or working slower because they don't have enough fruit in front of them. So to fully utilize your machine, you need to do load balance. Um, and I will conclude here. I, I would like to thank you, but I will also like to thank uh, my uh, two graduate students, Zheng Haofei, who was working on the Orchard platform for his PhD, and Chen, who was working on Frailbots. Of course, there was a bunch of people working on these projects. Uh, Denis Adovsky is our lab engineer. Um, and then I would like to uh, thank the growers um, and USDA and IFA for, for providing financial support. Uh, I will stop here. I will be happy to take any questions. Um, or uh, answer questions. Thank you. And Rose, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I think since we are just um, trying to keep on schedule here, if you could actually uh, answer the questions by just typing in an answer, I think you should be able to see those in the uh, yes. Q&A section. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and I will, I will type the answers in the Q&A. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I think this was a really interesting start to the morning, uh, learning a little bit about some of the challenges that we're going to have in automating things in agriculture. Um, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers again um, for providing really kind of interesting um, observations about some of the things that they're doing in their research labs and some of the challenges that there might be happening uh, to make this a reality. Uh, we are now scheduled for a break. Uh, the next session on remote sensing will start at 10.35. Um, I, Eric or Sherry, I don't know if you have any kind of housekeeping um, announcements to make, uh, but if not, uh, we'll see everybody back at 10.35. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I think we're good. Well, let's uh, begin the next session. Um, my name is Michael Kahn. I'm the Irrigation and uh, Water Resources Advisor in, with UC Cooperative Extension and uh, work out of on the Central Coast. And uh, uh, also helping co-chair this is Florence Gassel, uh, at from Fresno State. And we thought this session was well needed because there's been a lot of developments in ro remote sensing in the last uh, few years, uh, many different types of platforms from ground uh, to UAVs, airplanes, and satellites, and uh, more, I guess, uh, resolution and, and spans of wavelengths on the sensors. Um, and then the modeling um, of that information is, is getting more powerful. Of course, there's more computing power. Um, and the delivery methods uh, have become simplified so growers can take that information and do actionable um, you know, decisions. They can use that information to make decisions. So uh, we have a various uh, perspectives on remote sensing this, in this next session. Um, we're gonna begin with Forrest Melton, who's also collaborating with Lee Johnson. They both work with NASA and also they're um, working with uh, Cal State University Monterey Bay. Um, so um, I'll let uh, Forrest um, begin. Thanks, Michael. Go ahead and share my screen here.
All right, are my slides coming across? They're not in presentation mode. There you go. You're good to go. Great, thanks. So um, Michael had invited me to present a few months ago without thinking about it, I said, sure thing. And then when I actually stopped and thought about how much had happened over the last five years in the field of remote sensing, I realized that was a stupid thing. To, <laughs> that was a terrible invitation to accept. So what I'd like to do today is highlight just a couple of key advances and then talk about a few specific examples of tools that I think will be coming online this year or that are already available. That I think are, are really gonna simplify the process of accessing and using remote sensing data for decision-making in the field. So three key advances. First, when we look at freely available data from government satellites, the main advance I've seen over the last five years has been addressing this latency issue. So increasingly data from the Landsat satellites and the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 satellites are now available within 24 to 72 hours of satellite overpass. And that starts to make them really useful for day-to-day -day management decision-making. Key advantages of, of this source of satellite data is that it's free. Uh, Landsat provides an observation every eight days currently with two satellites flying every 16 days per satellite. Has a spatial resolution of 30 meters by 30 meters per pixel, or about uh, 0.22, about a quarter of an acre per pixel. Sentinel-2 provides an overpass every four to five days, depending upon where you are in the state, with a spatial resolution of about a tenth of an acre. And again, we're seeing data latencies consistently, consistently of about 72 hours or less. I know Jeff is gonna talk about the advances in some of the uh, applications of UAV data. I've, we've started to use UAVs just in the last three years. I've just been amazed at the advances in terms of ease of use and operation, the diversity of sensors, the quality of sensors. Uh, we've found them really useful for our research. Uh, the costs for these, whether you're using UAVs or uh, data from an aircraft um, operator or commercial satellite company, uh, again, increasingly easy to obtain. Uh, orders usually have to be submitted in advance, or of course, if you have a UAV, you can collect data on demand. Spatial resolution here can range from you know, approximately five centimeters up to five meters. And again, the turnaround times due to processing are, are increasingly less than 72 hours and sometimes a uh, yeah, same day delivery. Um, the other major advance has been in computing. Uh, of course, there are a number of commercial providers providing cloud computing services. Earth Engine, uh, which is very different from Google Earth. Um, this is an effort by Google, uh, a public benefit effort by Google to collect just about all of the publicly available satellite and climate data, bring it together onto their cloud, and they've provided um, a system for actually processing that data on their cloud. It's a freely available tool. And with eight lines of code, this example here, uh, I was able to uh, compute summary statistics from every Landsat scene in the US in about a minute. Um, so really powerful tools, major advances in terms of their usability for folks even with just a, a moderate uh, introductory level programming background. And we're seeing tools like climateengine.org uh, develop as implementations of just graphical user interfaces, web-based interfaces to these large data ar archives. So really powerful advances. A question I often get is, sort of how, how should I think about using data from different sources? Uh, the way I typically answer this, and I'll, I'll let Jeff add to my answer here in his remarks. Uh, when I think about the publicly available data, again, it, it's at a scale where it's not going to let you see individual plants. So they're useful for field-wide assessment of patterns and crop canopy conditions or evapotranspiration. Uh, really useful data for retrospective evaluation of, of irrigation, uh, calculation of irrigation efficiency metrics evaluation of irrigation system design. At the end of the day, you, you, wanna, you can use it to check to see if you add up the precipitation, applied water for irrigation, and subtract off your leaching fraction, and then you run off. Now, how close does that add up to the total ET for the season of the year? Uh, and then we're also starting to see the development of forecasted reference ET, which can, can be combined with the different satellite data sources to then start to inform irrigation scheduling and provide an increasingly useful forecast of, of irrigation demand. On the commercial side, you, you get the advantage of the high resolution data of seeing the plant scale information. So that can be useful for detection of missing trees, vines, uh, blocked emitters, leaks, problems with the irrigation system, things that are just not gonna show up in the freely available um, government satellite data sources. And then of course you have a whole range of other applications from yield forecasting, the pest and pathogen detection to nutrient management. So um, so where, where does that leave us? What What's coming? this over the next year 
first thing I wanted to highlight was uh, an effort called Open ET. Uh, this is um, a large effort that's developing an operational system for mapping evapotranspiration for the Western US at the scale of individual fields. So uh, this, is, this is now working in a beta version that's being tested by partners. I'll give you a very short one minute demo of this user interface here, in just a couple minutes, but it is developing, but it goes live um, here sometime uh, later this spring. Uh, it will provide data at daily, uh, monthly, and annual time steps at a spatial resolution of a quarter acre per pixel uh, for the 17 Western states. And data will be pre-computed to publicly available field boundaries and available with just a click of a mouse. Um, what's important about this project is that it represents a, a really an effort by the remote sensing community to solve this problem of making evapotranspiration data easily accessible and available. It involves three federal agencies. Uh, more than half a dozen universities, uh, uh, Google, we have international collaborators from Brazil. Uh, really a nice effort of a community of scientists coming together with uh, experts in technology and cloud computing and data visualization to try to address what's been a, a major barrier to using uh, ET data. And the project is targeting a, a number of applications. There's a couple that I think are relevant here today. One, just improved water budgets. Um, this can be important, especially as we think about implementation of of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California, but also ensuring that folks that have been investing in water conservation and water use efficiency on farms are getting credit for those past investments and that it's easy to go back and document uh, the benefits of those investments. Um, and then, of course, for day-to-day -day irrigation scheduling and management, really working hard to ensure that there's daily data available within 72 hours that can be ingested into other um, software systems that are already being used, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the project is being driven by a series of use cases, about a dozen use cases across the West. Just wanted to highlight two uh, that are specific for irrigation management. One, working with growers in Diamond Valley, Nevada, and then also working, in addition to our partners, uh, Microcom and our partner, partners at, at UCANR, also working with the Almond Board of California to to develop uh, link systems that pull data from OpenET and integrate it into applications that are useful in the field. At a really high level, um, sim simple overview of the schematic, what OpenET is doing is pulling together all the publicly available meteorological data, all the publicly available satellite data, uh, housing that on Earth Engine, running six different models, um, so running six widely used models, computing the summaries in a geodatabase, and then making that information available both through a web-based user interface, which I'll show you in a minute, as well as an application programming interface. And that API is important because we recognize that ET data, well, well it's useful for applications for irrigation scheduling and management um, and for a whole range of applications for water management across the West. It's most powerful when it's combined with other sources of information. So whether that's in integration into water accounting platforms, water data information systems uh, operated and maintained by local, state, and federal agencies, or more, most importantly, irrigation management uh, software or other farm and ranch management applications, having that API that allows the data to be retrieved and integrated into those applications where folks can easily access it, don't need to install another app or another tool, uh, I think is, is really, really important to making this data useful in the field. For those of you who have worked with uh, an ET data from a particular model or provider, uh, OpenET is doing something a little bit different, not just trying to pick one method, but you implementing six well-established uh, models that have been used by a state or federal agency operationally across the West. I'm guessing folks may be familiar with metric or CBAL. Those have been widely used in California by some of the consulting engineering firms. Uh, but what we're doing here is looking for the strengths of each of these different approaches to produce an ensemble value that will represent a consensus estimate from the science community of the best available estimate we can provide for any time and location. The system is driven, driven primarily with Landsat. Um, we pull data from a number of publicly available satellite data sources, uh, but Landsat's the real workhorse here. It gives us both measurements in the thermal wavelengths as well as the visible and near, near infrared. So that allows us to both solve the surface energy balance and tra track crop canopy development. Uh, we are limited to using freely available data just because trying to use commercial data or any high resolution data across the Western US would just be cost prohibitive. Uh, so we are driving it all with freely available satellite data. 
And a question I'm often asked is how accurate is remotely sensed data, especially for evapotranspiration? We are working really hard to answer that question as definitively as possible. We've compiled data from 190 flux tower sites. So these are these ed full eddy covariance stations. Each station costs about $50,000 uh, for all the in instrumentation. Uh, we're compiling sites from across the US. We've used 60 sites for a phase one uh, open comparison where the teams are, are gonna get the feedback. And because this is the first time these models have been implemented in a way that's fully automated across the Western US, we are giving teams a chance to identify any persistent biases and make corrections. Uh, phase two, then we're holding um, about 60% of the sites back, 130 towers for a fully blind accuracy assessment at the end. So trying to uh, <clears throat> give the teams an opportunity to correct any systematic errors, but ensure that we're, we're conducting a fully blind assessment. Importantly, none of the models are being calibrated to these uh, sites. They're not using information from these sites as inputs. They're fully independent. Uh, but so we're conducting this uh, fully independent blind assessment for these flux tower sites. Uh, for those of you that are, are familiar with flux towers or have used them in your research, um, we are, we spent almost a year now going through the sites, checking for energy balance, closure, um, seeing the list of the thresholds we're using here, ensuring that we have fewer than five dis missing days per month. Uh, at the end of the day, we had about 122 Ameriflux sites that passed these filters. 72 additional sites from our partners at USDA, Cooperative Extension, Reclamation, and some of our university partners, and then done a lot of QAQC and review on these sites to ensure that um, we're using high quality ground data for truth. And just to give you a sense as to what it's looking like, um, some good news here, table at the bottom provides a summary of the key statistics <clears throat> from phase one of this inner comparison uh, for monthly data. Uh, slopes pretty much all close to one, so minimal biases are both across the individual models, uh, slope of near one for the ensemble mean or value. Mean absolute error values uh, in the range of about a half a millimeter to two thirds of a millimeter uh, per day uh, is what those monthly values translate to. RMSE values of between two thirds and, and one millimeter per day and then really good R squared values. So they're scattered for sure, but, uh, but it's manageable. Importantly, when we aggregate sites, so this is the mean ET there in figure one across 15 sites for the growing season, teams worked hard to improve the consistency of the inputs. It's reduced a lot of the scatter across the ensemble. So we're seeing that the estimates from individual models are within about plus or minus 6% on average from the ensemble mean, and that ensemble mean is within about a percent of the mean from the flux towers. Similar story when we look at a full year's worth of data, we have 10 sites from this phase one 10, 10 cropland sites from phase one, where we have a full, at least one year of data. Uh, they're um, a bit more scattered in the winter, so that increases the range of to plus or minus 10%, but still really good agreement between the ensemble mean and the uh, flux tower ET from the closed energy balance. Just to give you some examples of what they look like for particular crops, two sites from California, one an almond site in the San Joaquin Valley. In general, the models track quite closely with what we're seeing from those flux tower measurements. In this example, we do see that two models have a low bias. They're below the unclosed energy balance and consistently lower than the ET measurements. If that persists, we will uh, go ahead and, and drop those from the ensemble. So we'll use the results from the inner comparison to only select models that are consistently performing well for particular crop types, regions, and seasons. Uh, another example here from uh, Rice and the Delta. So just wanted to give you a sense as to how this is looking uh, and that the teams work in, work in <laughs> putting in a lot of hours to make sure that we're providing a rigorous answer uh, to the question about how accurate are these approaches and models. I want to pause here just to make this a little bit more concrete, show you what this actually looks like. Um, are you still able to see my screen, Michael? Yes, you are. Yes, yes. That is, yes. okay. So this is the data we currently have. Uh, the field boundaries are all from publicly available field sources, about 4 billion data points in the system. Um, by the time we're done, over 100 billion data points. Uh, I'll go ahead and just to, actually, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at Shafter, California, just to show you how easy this should be to access data. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is once we get in here to about Zoom level 12, simply by placing your cursor over any individual field, data there's gonna pop up and so it'll 
go ahead and give you the time series data is available for uh, the last five years information is available both for individual fields as well as at that original satellite resolution of a quarter acre per pixel um, once a, a field is selected and go ahead and click on it now it's making a call to the database and it's actually retrieving the time series so this is the time series of monthly et this is an almond orchard uh, and we see the effects of as that develops from january 2016 through 2020 Looks like something that was probably planted in 2015, maybe 2016, and we see going through first, second, third leaf as that progresses. And so we can see the total ET there and that change in ET um, as that orchard matures. Uh, that information can all be downloaded uh, as an Excel file, as a CSV, as a graph or image. And again, if there's a location that's not covered by a field boundary that's loaded into the system from a publicly available source, information can also be retrieved for any location. Users can draw and select a boundary to retrieve that information for any location across the West. So community is working as hard as possible to try to really make it easy to access and use uh, ET data um, from satellites. So next question is, great. Now I've got a daily or monthly time series of ET. What do I do with it? So the Open ET project is trying to solve the problem of how do we provide accurate estimates of real-time crop ET with satellite data. The second piece is how do you turn that into a number that can be used in the field? And of course, ET is just one consideration. We also have to understand the irrigation system type and configuration, the distribution uniformity, soil texture, uh, issues related to salinity management, leaching fraction, pesticide applications, cultivation schedule, when is water available? And then of course, folks have to do that across multiple fields and ranches on any given day. Um, so the approach we're taking here is to using the API, link data from these types of systems uh, with existing irrigation management software. And we've been working with Michael Kahn uh, and the team at UCANR that's developed Crop Manage to use a similar API to, to prove that this integration is going to work. Crop Manage currently supports about 15 crops with, I think, two more coming this year. Uh, originally developed for cool season vegetable crops, but now being expanded to also support uh, to some almonds and other tree crops, as well as um, uh, wine grapes. And what we've done is taken one of the models from OpenET, the NASA Satellite Irrigation Management System, which provides, uh, it actually uses a reflectance-based approach. So what's nice about this is it's trying to estimate the ET under well-watered conditions. It's really being driven by measures of the crop canopy development and extent. And we're linking that with the crop managed system. So what we're doing is SIMS is processing all the satellite data, estimating fractional cover, relaying that to crop manage. So crop manage is automatically pulling that in. Uh, and then crop manage accepts the inputs from the user for all of the other factors, runs a soil water balance model, and then produces these field specific irrigation system runtimes and couples that with fertilizer recommendations, which is really powerful if you're managing water and fertilizer together. Another key feature of this approach is that the user has review and control of the satellite inputs. So this is on the left showing uh, the crop managed default fractional cover curve, sort of the idealized model. The estimates coming from SIMS showing how the crop is actually progressing. And then the user can also collect images with a, a, a camera, a digital camera, or even some of the uh, phone apps uh, to check both estimates. If the user wants to make a correction, crop manager will go ahead and recalculate that fractional curve. If the, if the user says, look, this, this, this uh, crop is ahead of schedule or behind schedule, or things are a little different in my field, uh, crop manager will go ahead and recalculate that fractional cover curve based on either the satellite data or user provided inputs, and then we'll provide a recommendation. So the user has ultimate control over the inputs and the determination on whether or not to accept the recommendations or do something different. Um, so it's really used to support and guide irrigation management as opposed to being a prescriptive system. Just quickly, uh, results from some of the field trials that Michael and Lee and, and our team at Cal State Monterey Bay um, have been working on. Uh, uh, most of these are using some type of randomized block design with replicated treatments. And what we've seen from trials so far is relative to a more static, uh, static schedule with a standard crop coefficient based generally towards the mid to the high end of the typical range, 
we're seeing reductions in applied water of anywhere between 20 to 40 percent. Uh, now, recognize that that is uh, usually in research trials, many of which are in commercial fields, some of which are at the USDA RS farm there in, in Salinas. Um, but still, meaningful opportunities to use dynamic data or use data, ET data, to inform a dynamic irrigation schedule that's being driven by day to day and week to week estimates of ET requirements. And of course, perfect irrigation efficiency is not the goal in all years. So that's an important thing to acknowledge that during wet years, some of that excess water can be used to help recharge groundwater. Um, and that there are a number of factors affecting irrigation management. But I, I think what these trials show is that there is, is potential value in using this approach. Uh, to further advance on farm water use efficiencies. And crop manage is continuing to add additional crops. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, SIMS were working on a mobile version, should be ready in May 2021. Uh, so for crops that are not supported by crop manage, at least the information on, on ET and uh, crop coefficients can be accessed and retrieved via the, via the mobile app. And then finally, um, Lee Johnson is working on a tool specifically for calculation of water use efficiency metrics. Uh, to com uh, consistent with the guidebook to assist agricultural water suppliers to prepare 2020 cultural water man management plans developed by DWR. Uh, this is expected in October 2021, and this will um, provide a lot of the same functionality as crop manage, but specifically for calculating uh, crop consumptive use fractions, agronomic water use fractions, and total water use fractions. So another, another capability that will integrate satellite data um, along with input from, from users. Couple of resources and links here for some of the things I've talked about and happy to answer questions now or in the chat. Thanks so much. Thank you, Forrest. Um, very nice presentation. And let me get my video back here. Okay. Yeah, so there's a number of questions. We have about five minutes. Some are okay. in the, the uh, question answer section. I don't know if you can see that, um, but uh, I will, I'll stop sharing my screen there. So yeah, I can, yeah, now I can but, see the Q&A. Well, the first question pertains to the flux towers. Um, and, and the question is, are these existing towers and why aren't they evenly uh, distributed within the country? Uh, we are taking advantage of the existing towers and data sets that were previously collected. So, um, Yes, especially for many of the sites. Some of them have been in operation for you know, eight, 10 years. Uh, those are really valuable sites for us. Um, but yes, they were all existing towers and we we're based, we we're using data that has been previously collected. Is the short answer. Yeah. And I think the next question relates to the open ET um, and just in general. But, you know, in, in orchards, we often have cover crops. So mm -hmm. how do you, um, use that information because obviously you'd be estimating ET, you know, for the middles, not just the trees. Yeah, at the scale, uh, at the scale for which Landsat provides, I should recommend, I should mention that the data goes back to 1985. So we will also be able to provide historic data. But at the scale of Landsat, we really can't easily distinguish cover crops uh, from the from the canopies or vine or tree canopies. So the ET is gonna be the total ET from the field, including both the tree or vine canopy and the cover crop. So it will, it will capture both. Uh, some of the models, dyslexia and others are working on techniques to try to um, separate the ET from the cover crop, from the ET from the vines and, and partition that. But open ET is gonna give you the total ET. That ET estimate will also include ET from precipitation We'll be working on uh, functionality to help help separate the ET from effective precip from ET from the uh, applied water, but currently the ET is the total ET from all sources in the field. Here's another question uh, for you, um, and I'm not sure what S SWIR data is on Sentinel 20M, but they asking uh, Sorry, can you use that to predict leaf water potential? From from Sentinel shortwave infrared, uh, can you predict leaf water potential? P possibly. Um, if you could send me that question via email, I want to check just a couple of papers and see how how much progress has been made on that. Happy to answer that question. Um, 
I'll, I'll reshare my screen here at the very end just so you can jot down my email address. But I, I can't okay. give you a clean answer on that right now. All right. I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions. I can type in um, or you can type in for us the answers uh, to other ones that are on there. Um, I'd like to thank you, you know, for your presentation. It was very good. And then um, we're going to um, move on with our next presentation from uh, Jeff Ore from GeoVisual. Hi, Jeff. Hello, and, Michael. Yes. So uh, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with Jeff over the last year, and it's very impressed with the, what they're doing, um, you know, with UAV technology and in giving us um, more actionable um, decision support type of information that a grower can use right away. So I'll let you uh, take it away, Jeff. Okay. Thanks. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, um, I'd say good, uh, good compliment here, uh, Michael, in putting together this session um, because uh, Forrest talked about things at a satellite scale, and now we're going to go down to the other spatial scale and get uh, very detailed. Uh, so I just want to give a little bit of context. I'm the chief science <coughs> officer of this company, Geovisual Analytics. Um, we're a data analytics company that's exclusively focused on the specialty crop industry. Uh, we're a, kind of a scrappy startup. We've been around for a while and have gotten some traction in the industry, but um, we, we really decided to focus on, on this sector of the ag industry. Uh, we are not a drone company, <laughs> but uh, we pretend to be one. We do fly our own drones. And uh, let me make sure my screen can advance here. There we go. Um, uh, out of necessity, you know, as um, Forrest described, there's, there's a lot of uh, hardware out there. There's a lot of processing capability out there. And we had hoped to find something that pretty much off the shelf that we could use, but we found that it was really necessary to uh, kind of roll our own as little as possible. We actually do either we fly our own drones. That's one of our uh, staff engineers who also has her uh, UAV uh, class license. So she flies for us some, as well as some contracted drone pilots. And we use a pretty standard commercial drone, a DJI Matrice 600. And uh, we have a couple sensors on there. We've got a standard RGB camera, as well as one modified to collect NIR. And we have a uh, georeferencing system as well, so we can keep track of where the, the drone is pretty accurately. Uh, and we're able to collect routinely one centimeter GSD pixel imagery. And um, I'll say that, you know, without going into too much detail, you can, you can ask me later if you're interested in more of the details, but uh, most of the time consumed with collecting this imagery is moving between fields. So taking the drone out of the truck and setting it up and, and getting it going, it doesn't take that long to fly a typical, say, 10 acre uh, vegetable field. And um, yet much of it's that travel time. So, you know, that aside, we've worked out a pretty efficient pipeline for processing a lot of, post-processing a lot of that imagery um, with some photogrammetric processing and then our own proprietary analytics processing. And um, we've been working with Michael now for about a year on a, a funded project associated with irrigation that I'll talk about. Uh, but I first wanted to kind of give you an idea of what the imagery looks like and some of the other applications that uh, commercially, we're focused on as a small uh, private company, um, working very closely with growers and some of the major producers in the Salinas Valley and then also down in Arizona. Um, so here's uh, one example field from uh, this irrigation study that we're involved with with Michael and I'll talk about in a moment. But um, just to give you an idea, we can obviously post-process the imagery and do kind of a, an ND, typical vegetation index of our choosing. Here's an NDVI color mapped index from one of the fields. And just kind of interesting here is, you know, given the scale of spatial resolution, you can see details of what's happened at the kind of intra-field intra level. So, um, you know, I'll talk more about that and connect it to forest comments when we talk more about irrigation. But in this case, 
um, you can see in the upper right hand corner there was, uh, because this was a drip uh, germination trial with a grower in the Salinas Valley, there were some irrigation line issues and you can see some flooding in the, in the upper left portion of the field. And so we'll take a look at that now. And um, I'm just gonna walk through some images that we collected on more or less a weekly basis. Now we did this as part of our commercial operations. So we, we couldn't guarantee uh, you know, a perfect uh, seven days in between collects. Um, also very much a challenge with doing a program like this in conjunction with uh, commercial agriculture is that it's commercial agriculture as many of you know, they, they have a lot going on and we're, we work very hard to be respectful of not getting in their way. Uh, and coordinating things in such a way that we're helpful and, and not um, a detriment to their do, doing their important job. That being said, you can see down in the little uh, legend here on the screen, um, WD is wet date. So these are images collected a certain number of days after wet date. Uh, the first one after wet date, you, you really couldn't see the plants that well anyway. They're pretty, uh, pretty small at, even here uh, at day 36 after wet date. But I want to point out, you can see the dampness of the soil uh, in that upper corner due to some presumably irrigation problems. And as it kind of advance over time, you can see the plants emerging there. You can still see perhaps the field a bit darker there in the upper section. And then as the field progresses, later and later collects, you can see that it's affected the overall stand count or the, the plant population in that zone. Um, it's not just a question of, of maybe some plants dying, but also some of them were a little bit stunted. And I'll talk about that in a moment and how that will affect the overall um, you know, yield of the field. But as the, as the plants progress, you can see generally they have pretty, pretty consistent uniform um, coverage with some exceptions. It's actually the yield on this field turned out to be pretty good. Um, but certainly this area was, you know, if it wasn't a perfect field, this is why. And you can just therefore see some of the early irrigation effects and how they impact ultimately the yield. Um, and this was the last image we collected and it was about a week before harvest. Um, so, uh, you know, just give you some idea of how the high resolution imagery both spatially um, can be helpful and then temporally. Um, it's really a question of, you know, what's the cost of doing so and what's the value to a commercial customer uh, and, um, we typically don't fly fields for customers half a dozen times. It's just not cost effective. Uh, we'll fly typically a couple times, um, but you can see for a research um, standpoint, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting and can be useful to have that kind of a time series. Um, one thing I wanna point out around the uniformity, and I'll talk more about this around our irrigation study, but one thing we're working on is, you know, when you have this kind of high resolution imagery, um, you can, do analytics on the, you know, on a very small spatial scale. And what you see here is a, is a color map version of what the, the forecasted plant size is going to be, the actual head size. So it's forecasted because we project ahead, we use some weather data, um, and we have a lot of historical data we can use. Um, and so we can give some idea ahead of time of what the yield is going to be across the field. And then the punchline here is that, you know, if you have that kind of spatial resolution, then you could partition that field and you could say, well, okay, we've got segments where you have a high number of what they call 24s. That's, those are lettuce heads that are iceberg heads that are of the right size that you can fit, uh, fit them into a standard 24 head carton um, versus the less, less valuable 30 smaller heads. But you could then partition the field um, into segments where you're gonna see you're gonna have the highest commercial yield. Uh, and in fact, this customer based on uh, the feedback we gave them, um, they proceeded as following. They, they did harvest about two thirds of the field, the upper segment of the field where there were more higher value, larger heads. Uh, and then they pushed out the harvest of a third or so of the field a few days and let those heads mature and get a little bit bigger. So if you know a grower has that kind of, or really the harvester has that kind of flexibility and there's a lot to be said about that, right? As we as we see more automated harvesting. Um, this kind of information can be useful where it's fed into a harvester uh, and you can make those kinds of financial decisions about what's the best strategy for harvesting multiple fields. And it's really becomes, kind of becomes a logistics problem. 
you know, and that this speaks to that where there may be segments of the field that you decide it's not even worth harvesting, and so you uh, dis them under, um, and uh, and then uh, you know presumably save as a result. It makes it cost effective. So those are kind of some general comments about how this could be used for harvesting. And then I wanted to check in my time here. Um, wanted to jump into this irrigation project that um, Geovisual is collaborating with Michael and his team at UCANR. This is a project funded by the Foundation for Food and Ag Research. And uh, it's about a year in. Um, I'm gonna, it's, so it's a work in progress and you'll see that in some of our results. We, um, you know, given some of the challenges with the pandemic of being out in the field and getting out, we, we basically got started about halfway through the year. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we have some pretty interesting I'd say preliminary results to share that I think um, relate well to, to forest comments as well. So part of this project is what I'm gonna talk about. And that was the objectives whereby uh, we are gonna use this higher resolution UAV imagery to really look at how we might be able to improve the precision of, of this uh, evaporation, ET based you know, irrigation scheduling tools um, and also expand their use for the industry. So back to um, you know, this whole idea of um, scale, uh, given the vegetable farmers challenges around a lot of relatively small fields that are turned rather quickly, um, they don't have a lot of time for irrigation. And really the driver now is regulatory driven where they have to think about their water budgets in terms of um, groundwater pollution, right? Um, salinity down in Arizona. Um, environmental challenges they're having to face. Um, so our, you know, as us working with primarily the commercial farming industry are really looking at ways that we can bring some, some of the science and really make it more efficient in an industrial agricultural setting. Um, and so that's where it's been really interesting getting up to speed on, on what Michael and his team are doing with crop manage and seeing if there's ways that we can complement it given that we're out there in the field collecting imagery we're working closely with the growers on some of their other problems as well. So the idea then ultimately is to collect some higher res UAV imagery and compare it to existing capabilities, including crop manage and, and SIMS that Forrest mentioned. And there's, um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff to do, including you know, looking at open EV now. I'm very excited about what Forrest shared as an update there. Okay, with that as background, so go to another field that was part of this FFAR study uh, this is a field that was germinated with sprinklers instead of a drip system. A little larger field in the, on the same ranch in the Salinas Valley. Here again, you see the color-coded NDVI. And the takeaway from this is it's a much more uniform field than the other one. So uh, the reason I chose this one to talk about today is because uh, uniformity in the field is, is really critical for growers. Uh, they want a perfect field if they can get it, but for a lot of reasons, they can't get it. And, and Forrest mentioned many of them in, in a list there, just uh, or as one farmer said, you know, we have a factory with no roof. So that alone makes, makes it challenging. Um, but we wanted to look at some of the comparisons we're starting to get with our UV, UAV imagery and um, the satellite imagery that Forrest discussed. Uh, so first, just kind of precursor on this field, it's relatively uniform. Um, another measure we can make because we've got really plant level, you know, measurements here. Um, we're collecting, we can collect one centimeter pixel imagery, and that's what we did for this trial field. And uh, then what we can do is actually count plants. And we've mapped here to a color map, the stand density. So green areas are uh, rather uniform and uh, brownish areas are effectively missing plants. And it's kind of smoothed out. Um, there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, the color map looks better actually when there are, uh, a, there's a more a broader distribution of, of stand uh, density. But the, the punchline here is that it's, this is a quite a relatively uniform field. Um, and then zooming in, you can kind of see the results just before harvest again, 72 days after wet day. This is pretty typical of a good field. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of little miss, you know, missing plants due to disease, sclerotinia, and um, they had this uh, disease prolific this past year in patients in the area. Um, but generally, you know, discounting that was a pretty good field to look at from a fractional cover or canopy cover standpoint. And that's what we um, there, you know, then did. <clears throat> so Forrest had a, a figure, similar figure up with 
uh, the crop manage interface to portray the fractional cover. And you can see the SIMS satellite derived fractional cover estimates there as the green triangles. And then the user data that he alluded to, well, in that case, we've input our UAV derived imagery uh, fractional cover. And right away, you can see it's lower. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but just as a little way of background on where we're going with this. So for folks who aren't that familiar with irrigation um, and evapotranspiration, so the idea here is versus a complete energy balance model is that you drive the ET for a specific crop based on a reference ET, typically from a weather station. So the SIMIS system is a, is a common, common system that's used in California and we use as well. Uh, and then you're really trying to get the, an accurate representation of this crop coefficient, which is just a scale factor for your reference, reference ET. Uh, and that's why you want to get canopy cover. And that changes over time. And so the question is, you know, well, how accurate is accurate enough? We have some work to do to, you know, square the differences between what we got from our UV, UAV imagery to, uh, to SIMS. And that's what this second year is going to be about. Um, also, I just want to note on the method we used. What we did in this case was because we can count all the plants uh, in the field and we know the size of the field, we can also derive that. So we can use that to get um, our estimate of the you know, average fractional cover for the field. And we call this ground area cover because we're actually getting the, the area coverage of each, each plant. And um, so it's, it's underestimating that. And that's something we had to look at. Well, the, the important thing here is we have effectively lots of different resolutions we could choose from and compare because we have such high resolution complex of the field with the UAV. So what we did is we, we stepped back and we said, okay, let's, let's take that, that ground area cover sort of average across the field. Let's compare it to more of a subfield average measurement. So what we did is we just took kind of tiles from that field of the UAV imagery. Um, there were about uh, there were about seven and a half meters by 10 meters. And the rows of, of produce in the field are about a meter. So depending on the orientation, you're definitely gonna get, you know, a, a much more uh, concentrated sampling. And so we took about half a dozen different uh, samples across, kind of distributed across the field and then competed what we call a subfield average. You can see there's, you know, it matches pretty early, uh, early on pretty well, but there's still some disparities from this limited sample set for this lettuce trial. So um, we need to get to the bottom of this. And at the point, at this point, you know, the point is that, um, that uh, spatial sampling matters. And so we, we've got a pretty good uh, way to measure that now. We've got the SIMS data. Um, we've got our own data. And you see here now we've plotted this subfield average across the, uh, this is a celery field. This is a separate field because also for this field, Michael's team was able to get um, some additional really, you know, High, high, high resolution sampling data with a, with a camera on a pole in the field, um, what he does, which he does typically, and he may want to speak or comment to this later. But you can see some compar comparisons where we're still underestimating a bit. Um, and I know Michael has said, you know, they'll typically go to the section of the field to take samples that's got a relatively high density of plants because you don't want to underestimate evapotranspiration. And that's really what. Um, we're um, now kind of focusing on is finding the right balance for the commercial grower where, um, you know, they, they're in the past, they haven't had to worry about how much water they put on the field, but because of regulation and doing the right thing and increased costs of electricity to run pumps and all, uh, there are some drivers now for them to, to save, but um, they cannot risk reducing uh, or risk a, a reduction in yield at the end of the day, because um, they invest a lot of money in this field and grow it for you know, between a month to three months and they want to see it pay out. So um, there's a big risk in underestimating ET for a grower. And so an overestimate is, is probably safer, but how much? And so that's really where we're going now with this, with the study is kind of looking at, well, what's the um, relative impact of over or underestimating your irrigation. And since we can now look at the uh, different resolutions of imagery, we can kind of play some games and, and maybe this is even something that could be added to a, an operational system for a grower where they can kind of weigh the risk based on other factors in the field that are going to affect the payout of that field. So just real quickly, here's a couple of uh, you know, examples of, of the crop manage um, crop coefficient model based on the fractional cover. Um, this is assuming uh, 
sprinkler germination. So you see the spikes where there's a sprinkler event. And so basically, you know, the field is saturated thoroughly. And so the crop coefficient is starts at one and then, and then rapidly goes down because of evaporation. Uh, and then you move into regime with drip irrigation. Um, and the point here is with the different colors is you can see that this is just a model, but you know, where you've got maybe a, a, a discrepancy in fractional cover like we're seeing in the UAV versus the satellite imagery to date. You know, what, um, and it may be, we may find in certain uh, instances that as we, you know, calibrate, co calibrate correctly, we may still have reasons to see kinds of discrepancies. And so you see on the right, you know, basing on, on Michael and, and Lee Johnson's model and, and the others for, uh, you know, how you use evapotranspiration to accumulate, and get an irrigation, adjusting for a, a distribution factor for the irrigation system. Um, you can see roughly that, you know, whatever your discrepancy is in terms of your fractional cover or something like 15, 20%, you're gonna get a similar, um, you know, result of irrigation uh, recommendation discrepancy. And so uh, this is sort of the way we're gonna can now do looking at, um, well, maybe, maybe, you know, for certain scenarios and um, field conditions, um, you can afford a little more error uh, than, than not. And there are obviously a lot of assumptions in here to look at, but um, I think the important thing here is that by having this higher resolution imagery, we can start looking at a lot of these factors in more detail. So um, with that, I'll just um, uh, summarize because I think I'm getting pretty close to out of time here. Um, just a few simple conclusions and then I uh, welcome comments. But, um, you know, around the UAV platform, um, we consider that, you know, this is an operational system now. At least we've, we've been able to take it to that point um, where you can get really high resolution, you know, at, at the field scale and, and below um, with the UAV. And, you um, now it's a matter of really continuing to make sure that whatever we do with that is cost effective for, for a grower or, or a production operation. Um, and then I get that example of, of harvest decisions. I think we think that there is still a lot of potential to use these kinds of tools, particularly when automation um, expands for harvest operations, uh, to use this to guide harvesting, uh, to, save the, to save the industry money, uh, and reduce waste along the way, right? Waste of inputs as well as, as wasted produce on the, on, the, um, on the backside. And then lastly, um, you know, the time series piece of this, well, that, that really speaks to the cost effectiveness and it's not cheap to send folks out and collect UAV imagery, uh, but in certain cases, certainly in a, in a research environment, it can be pretty, pretty cost effective to um, use as a tool. So I'm gonna end it there and uh, hopefully there's a little time for some questions. Thank you, Jeff. Very nice presentation. Um, do you see uh, one uh, question, a question and answer? Yeah, uh, not sure if it's for you or, or Forrest, but it was uh, with high, you know, ve very dense vegetation. Michael, I apologize. Uh, I have an external speaker here and I missed your comment oh. because all of a sudden I couldn't hear anything and it was because the speaker shut itself off. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you, comment. Jeff. Um, just going through a question here, uh, with high vegetation crops, uh, does NDVI saturate um, to make it less usable? Uh, that's maybe a, also a question for Forrest, but... Um, what um, we, you know, we are not as concerned with absolute NDVI and we don't work to calibrate that particularly over the time series. Um, we use it more of a, as a universe, uniformity tool across the field. Um, what really is more of a challenge for us in computing a consistent NDVI value and not saturating is the lighting conditions. Um, and, you know, we try to do this at a production scale, so many, many fields. And what does cause us pain sometimes is when we go from California to Yuma and the lighting conditions are different uh, down there. Uh, in the summer, uh, well, the winter time down there, but um, the, um, the, the way they'll orient the fields relative to path of the sun, um, we have had some challenges in that regard. Yeah. Can you also speak about, you know, as you interact with, with growers and your customers, what are the, some of the challenges you're having, you know, as operating this type of business? Yeah, well, I don't know how much time we have. 
Um, you have uh, one or two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I'll try to pick some of the kind of the general ones, and I'm sure you, you could speak to these as well. Um, I did allude to or mention earlier the just you know coordinating with the grower um, is is really important, and they're they're so busy. Um, you know, getting the information we need and helping them, I'd say, understand what information we need to help them is, is a big challenge. Um, often they're willing to provide you information uh, that, well, there's a hurdle around that first because there's a, there's a very much um, an attitude of competition in the industry where folks like to cooperate, but they're all competing. Many of the, you know, major operations are competing with one another, so they're not super eager to share too much. We sign non-disclosure agreements with every one of our growers. Um, I'd love to tell folks more about what we do, but I, you know, I had I purposely had to you know, keep, it, keep it a little more general because we don't want to share uh, grower-specific information. Um, so that makes it a little difficult to get the information you need. Uh, they're wary of any commercial entity, including us, even though we've been working now with them for a while. Um, you know, taking that information and and sharing it out or using it as a big data play and um, you know ma making money off of their information. So, uh, so that's been a big hurdle. Once you overcome that, then it's getting the data in the right format that you need. So if they're, I mean, specifically just getting their harvest schedules, when they planted the field, what they planted, what variety, when they're gonna harvest it, um, those kinds of things. Everybody has a different format, most are in spreadsheets, but um, you know, those are the kinds of challenges in general of uh, working in an industrial setting trying to do some science. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. Um, we, that was a very nice presentation and we do need to move on to our next one, uh, which will be from uh, Alizera uh, Pereza. He's in the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at UC Davis. And he's going to take us into a, a sort of a different uh, direction, um, looking at, uh, nitrogen in vineyards. Well, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Ali Leza, uh, Paul Leza, and I am a CA specialist at UC Davis. And uh, today I will talk about high resolution nitrogen monitoring and a little bit about the application of drone imaging, uh, the challenges and the advantages for the specialty crop of California. So uh, why nitrogen? Uh, we all know that nitrogen is uh, one of the most important elements uh, that uh, affect the function of the crop. Uh, there are problems with uh, under application or over application of nitrogen. Under application will uh, um, reduce the maximum um, growth for the plant and over application will uh, result in leaching to groundwater and uh, environmental contamination, which is strongly um, uh, advised against that. So growers needs to uh, have planned to do sampling and apply nitrogen in a, a precise and accurate way. Uh, we know that uh, there are four, uh, different R's that are important for nitrogen management, uh, right rate, right time, right place, and right sources. And the understanding and determination of these uh, variables are important and challenging, especially for large uh, orchards or vineyards. But now we know that using remote sensing techniques, we can uh, precisely and accurately determine three of these four R's that would improve uh, nitrogen management. So uh, let's take a look at the overall um, drone application that we developed at the Digital Agriculture Lab. And uh, we believe that all of these steps needs to be conducted accurately and uh, precisely if we want to have uh, some reliable outcome out of that. That includes some data collection from the ground truthing, very important step of calibration, which is mostly in, ignored in commercial application that uh, includes radiometric calibration, 
uh, removing uh, environmental and sensor dependent negative um, impacts on the imagery that that uh, if we do not do this we may come up with uh, wrong um, outcomes uh, then processing that uh, usually involve extracting information uh, from the uh, extracting features from the aerial imagery and last step is analytics so for the analytics, we need to find out, first of all, what kind of feature are important for the application we are looking for. And we need to supplement that with a lot of grant tools data to make them reliable. OK, so I may come back to this, uh, but uh, let's uh, talk about drone imaging and why we uh, use drone instead of manned aircraft or satellite for a specialty crop. Um, First of all, drone will provide us with high resolution imagery that is very good for a specialty crop of California because if we use lower resolution, we will have to deal with mixed pixel uh, that uh, will reduce the accuracy of the model. Uh, for nitrogen monitoring, uh, the industry industrial standard is to collect the leaf tissue from random locations and then combine them together and conduct uh, leaf analysis or tissue analysis. Uh, well, there are a number of different uh, issues with this method, basically because uh, we are combining samples from different locations. Uh, we are not looking at the specific nitrogen level. So uh, any within uh, combination variability will be lost and that would reduce the accuracy. On the other hand, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, or UAVs or drones are uh, readily available, accessible, very inexpensive. And as you saw in the last presentations, they can provide you with a high resolution imagery. But we need to uh, interpret those imagery to find out some useful knowledge out of that. So uh, I'm going to talk about two objectives today. Um, first, uh, first of all, the way that we want to map the nitrogen in a vineyard is to use a multispectral camera, but uh, multispectral cameras are usually available in fixed bands. And we know that not always those fixed bands are the most important bands for the specific application. So uh, we ran a hyperspectral uh, data analytics to understand the most informative wavelengths uh, for nitrogen in uh, table grade. Um, so uh, if you are familiar with hyperspectral, you will know that any uh, object uh, will have a, a spectral signature or a spectral uh, reflectance over different uh, wavelengths, and that would uh, shake, shape a kind of a signature. And this is a um, standard signature of a leaf. So we can see up to this 0.7 micrometer, and we cannot see over that. So we can see there's a lot of information in a non-visible band that can be useful, but we don't know which of them. So we want to explore uh some of those relevant wavelengths here um so we developed a sensor that is called cobin that's a hyperspectral field measurement tool and this sensor can uh, cover up to 1.6 micrometer um, so this is uh, the sensor that we developed uh, it has um, light sources and uh, several spectrometers and um, as you see here we collected uh, data from a um, vineyard an experimental plot and we collected leaf samples up to 20 leaf samples from each individual vine and uh, for up to 150 vine so we collected a pretty large data set of spectral data that are labeled <coughs> Then at each time of data collection, we collected uh, those, uh, we derived those leaf samples and send them to the laboratory to uh, measure the nitrogen level. 
So uh, as I mentioned, the hyperspectral sensor provides you with a very high resolution spectral data. And uh, we need to find, uh, first of all, the most relevant data. So we developed a band selection method uh, that includes multiple steps. Um, this sensor that we use has over 2,000 different bands. And those are a lot of bands. Um, so first of all, we need to remove those bands that are highly correlated. And so for example, here you can see the windows of adjacent bands that are highly correlated and we can uh, sum up and take average and that wouldn't change the result. So that was the first step is to uh, reduce the dimension of the data set. Then for finding the best uh, number of bands or the most correlated bands, uh, there are many different methods that people are using. And we developed a method that is an ensemble of three most uh, important ranker methods. So this way, um, we have multiple ideas from different methods, and then we can combine them here. So uh, you can see six different rankers. Each two of them are uh, um, in one type of ranking methods. And uh, you can see this as a voting for different bands. So uh, you can see that most of the rankers selected this window as the most informative band for a nitrogen in table grade and also some bands in shortwave infrared. Um, so uh, this is a little bit detail about the selection of subset of bands that provides us with the best uh, accuracy. So uh, maybe I can skip that. And after a few uh, round of uh, elimination, finally we will come up with the best combination of bands that would the, the um, uh, would provide us with the best nitrogen level detection. And here you can see 400, 600, uh, 810 nanometers, and then here one band at 1400 and uh, another band at 1600 nanometers uh, have been selected as the best informative bands for nitrogen. So if we want to develop a new multispectral camera that um, uh, will give us the best nitrogen mapping, we need to uh, select a camera that includes those bands. And we know that many of those uh, available commercial uh, multispectral cameras, they do not have those. So uh, let's say if we just want to use a visible, uh, we can see that there are three bands among the six bands that are important and they are within the visible bands. So uh, we can come up with about 65% accuracy. If we add a near infrared, uh, then we use four bands, so we can increase the accuracy of detection up to 74. But if we also add short wave infrared, including uh, 14 and 1600 nanometers, we can improve the accuracy up to 65 and 66 percent, uh, 85 and 86 percent, which is um, beyond expectation from a remote sensing application. So. In conclusion, these are the bands that we selected in the first objective. In the second objective, we uh, used a multi-spectral camera uh, to uh, collect also aerial imagery from those experimental blocks and see, uh, compare the vegetation indices that we can uh, extract from those vines to some other new methods, uh, machine learning algorithm for nitrogen detection. And uh, I saw there are a few questions about NDVI and vegetation indices, and they get saturated, especially at high values where uh, most of the detection happens. And then there is calibration involved. So if we do not calibrate well, we may come up with wrong uh, NDVI values. So I understand the concern with uh, NDVI. And in this objective too, I'm going to compare NDVI with some new methods. Um, 
There has been a few slides in the previous presentation about aerial data collection, different platforms that uh, you can use, fixed platform or quadcopters and different uh, type of cameras that are available. Um, this is just, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's playing yet, aerial hyperspectral imaging that we did uh, for one uh, tomato field and uh, this is about the two hours of data collection. I just wanted to show you uh, how difficult it would be if you want to make sure that the data you're collecting is accurate and precise and can be actually used later. Um, yeah, so we put a lot of uh, ground uh, reference panels at different parts of the orchards. Uh, or field, and we will use those for uh, calibration, uh, as well as the downwelling sensor that is mounted on the top of the camera. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, the second objective. So, this is an overall workflow of we, what we have done in this project. We collected aerial data. First of all, we made sure that our data are normalized and calibrated, both uh, sensor-wise and environmental-wise. And then we collected leaf samples. So we did laboratory assessment, measured end concentration, and then input all this data to train machine learning algorithm instead of using a vegetation indices. Then uh, we had some... Um, samples from unknown uh, vines and then uh, inputting those samples uh, we can classify them into uh, a range of n concentration for example from low end to high end we can do that for every single vine in a vineyard and then come up with some uh, nitrogen zoning the nitrogen zoning shows uh, the nitrogen concentration at different uh, location in the field and uh, if we can we probably need to apply variable rate application to uh, uh, supplement the area with low end so uh, a few slides about the experiment uh, as i mentioned we had five different um, uh, we have 150 vines and we had three different application rate. Well, in two criteria in a slot, two application and uh, uh, 10 uh, spoon feet, so 10. So in total, three rate and two application frequency, six different uh, rates. Uh, so that's to uh, induce a different range of nitrogen level in the vines. And uh, so this is an RGB. For each block, we put the reflectance uh, panel in the image so we can uh, calibrate imagery separately and make sure that we are getting as close as possible to the true spectral reflectance. Uh, then uh, we segmented the canopy and we can segment the vegetation as well. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, did uh, leaf and tissue sampling, but we only use the leaf sample result for uh, the calibration. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, histogram and uh, is a stack histogram of that, but you can see also the application rate. And uh, we can see that regardless of the application rate, we, uh, for example, for zero application rate, we have vines that are very low in nitrogen to uh, vines that are high or in the medium range. And also for vines that receive the maximum amount of N, some of, most of them are in the higher end, but we can see also some of them in the lower end. So one take home message from this is that application uh, rate does not guarantee the nitrogen uptake. So um, we may have uh, a good application rate, but don't have a good uh, nitrogen uptake and eventually we have low nitrogen level in the leaf. And also here, if you compare a high end and low end leaf, we can uh, see that in the visible range, the high end leaf looks a little bit uh, darker 
because it absorbs more light in the par area. And low end, which is under stress, uh, that reflects more light in the visible range and low, lower light in the near infrared. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, the scatter plot of the predicted nit nitrogen and measured nitrogen. So I just briefly explained that how we train the classifier. We just selected the two extreme of N, uh, like very low and very high, and trained a classifier with these two extreme. But we use the result as a regression, not as a classification. So that's a, the result is a probability of a sample to be a, in the excess N class. And if that probability is less, that wine is more, most uh, probably low nitrogen or under stress. And we can see here that there is a good correlation between uh, our prediction and the actual nitrogen level in each wine. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we wanted to compare the supervised learning methods with vegetation indices. Um, yes, there are a lot of, um, saturation in NDVI at values around 0.9. And here we can see uh, high nitrogen and low nitrogen wines spectrum in um, NDVI. And this is uh, all pixels. So we can see that as a histogram and we can see a lot of overlap between high end and low end. So this is like 2.4, this is almost twice that. There should be a distinctive um, uh, uh, distinctive uh, signal in the histogram, but we can't see that here. In NDRE, we can see that more obviously, but there's still a big uh, overlap between the high end and low end pixels. But the method that we use that measure the probability of each pixel to belong uh, to a high end class, we can see a very good distinction between the two. And if we uh, visualize that on the vines here, we can see that. So there are 10 vines here, and uh, they are ranging from very low and uh, equal to 2.5 up to 3.5. And we have also one uh, more than four. And this is the probability image. This is not the actual image. This is just a prob probability image between zero and one that can be compared to NDVI and NDRT. And here, what we can see that uh, when the nitrogen level is too high, the canopy appears very green, dark green, and uh, distinctively green compared to this one, which is 2.4 or 2.5. But uh, let's compare, for example, this wine, which is uh, 4.19 to this line, which is 2.8 in NDVI. Uh, they look pretty much the same. So that's the saturation that concerns many girls and many industry about using the uh, vegetation indices. Um, NDRE does a little bit of a better job, but still uh, the saturation problem uh, exists for these lines. So, uh, take home messages. Um, random tissue sampling is a low resolution method. We saw that within the same block of five wines that received exactly the same amount of nitrogen, we see a lot of variability. So, uh, so there are, there exist a lot of variability in the field that we just don't see that. And because of that, we cannot ignore that. And uh, aerial imaging can reveal those variability. So, uh, drone imagery can, uh, yeah, reveal those variability and they are accessible and uh, inexpensive and can be used. The only thing that we need is a scientifically approved model and uh, pre-processing and processing pipeline that um, uh, ensure the accuracy of the outcome. Okay, so uh, I've worked with a number of different people and faculty at UC Davis uh, for this 
project and uh, thank you very much for the attention. Uh, you can go to my lab website for more information or send me email. And I think right now I have, we have some time for uh, questions. Thank you, Ali Zira. Very nice. Uh, Ali Reza actually is my name. Ali Reza, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, See, there may be some questions in the uh, question answer box. Don't see any right now. Ah, here's one. Um, for UAV multi or hyperspectral end monitoring, do you need a reference strip in the field as a data as data for you know your fertilizer decisions? Uh, yeah, that's a million dollar question. So uh, we are trying to make, uh, to develop a generalizable model that we do, that can handle the end sensing and end mapping without any ground truth data. Uh, of course, if we have access to some ground truth data, we can further calibrate and make more uh, accurate result, but that's not always available. So uh, our goal is to, uh, have a model that independent of any additional ground truth data can provide good result. Very good. Uh, one question I had was, I wasn't clear when, when you're using the UAV, are you using uh, some of those wavelengths that you were, you found that were ideal for distinguishing uh, nitrogen or were you just using a different algorithm with some existing ban bandwidths? on these cameras? So uh, from the hyperspectral analysis, we want to see what are those important bands, right? So, uh, and what is the bandwidth of those? So some of those bands are pretty narrow, maybe 10, 10 nanometers, but some of them are pretty wide, like 40 nanometers, right? So for example, if you find a bad, uh, band at 800 nanometers with 40 nanometers bandwidth, that means if you have a camera that has a band at 780 or 820, that still works. But, um, but the uh, ultimate goal is to develop, develop new cameras that includes all those important bands or have cameras with adjustable band so we can modify them before each application. I see. Uh, one last question, then we have to move on. Um, how are you able to separate chlorosis uh, caused by, say, potassium or magnesium deficiency from a deficiency caused by nitrogen? That's, again, a very good uh, question. Uh, we just uh, received a new grant from USDA to do that exact research. So this year, we will uh, we will uh, create nitrogen and magnesium deficiency to identify the um, a specific symptom to each uh, nutrition and see if there is any difference. So yeah, we don't know that and nobody knows that. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for your presentation um, yes. and uh, we appreciate your time. So, so this ends our session and um, we're going to take a break for lunch, but uh, I want to urge everyone uh, to come back because, um, you know, generally if we're doing this live, we would we'd have a little uh, luncheon and we would present um, some uh, awards to honorees who dedicated their whole careers uh, in, into agronomy in California and have had significant contributions. So we're going to do this virtually today at um, starting at 1225. So please come back, uh, get a quick lunch. Uh, you can eat it while you listen. Um, we're going to present awards to Marsha Campbell Matthews and Keith Backman, both who are very much deserving of these awards. So please come back um, at 1225.
Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us to honor the 2021 California chapter of the American Society of Agronomy Honorees. Um, my name is Karen Lowell. I'm an agronomist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I am the, also the past president of this organization, which gives me the pleasure of organizing and um, moderating this session to honor the people who've been chosen as our honorees. And this is probably one of my favorite parts of being on the board is having the opportunity to, to take part in this part of our work. Um, it's very inspiring to review all these wonderful folks who are nominated for this honor. Um, you sort of get a chance to meet the best of the best. And for all of the students who are joining us today, I encourage you to go to our website and look through the archive um, proceedings um, and read up on some of these honorees. These are some people who are real leaders in the field and might give you examples of the kinds of things that put together a very richly meaningful professional arc. Um, I We have the full biographies of the two people that we are honoring today in a link um, in the chat, and you can read them in full there. Uh, their presenters will touch on some of the things, but there's more in those write-ups. So please have a look there. Um, so who do we honor and why do we choose these particular individuals? So generally we choose people who have retired as much as overachievers ever really retire. <laughs> Um, and the accomplishments that they've achieved in their professional lives, but critically also, how have they used their capacity as they've become successful, high highly productive professionals to serve? So to serve the profession of which they are a member, agronomy here in California, but also the farmers that we serve as agronomists here in the state. And what I think sets this award apart um, and then some other awards is that might emphasize, you know, a breakthrough in some technology or breeding accomplishment in, you know, development of new knowledge. This award is really a critical part of deciding who we select is how well did they carry the delivery of um, that work, what is started to be called the last mile, all the way to having an impact on the profession and on the people that our profession serves, namely farmers here in the state of California, growers as we call them here. Um, sorry, I'm from the East Coast. <laughs> so how are they selected? Um, they're nominated by their peers, and you'll have an opportunity to nominate people at the end of the conference. We, On our evaluation, we always give a place for people to nominate um, future nominees. Um, and then they're voted on by the board, the, the current sitting board, which I think it's important to note that that includes private sector, public sector, so government, um, university, uh, private consulting firms, private CCAs, all range of people in research, applied work. Um, and these individuals that we're honoring are recognized among that diverse set of peers as being deserving of the award. Um, and that's, I think, very special and worth noting. So this year's honorees, we have Marcia Campbell, who is, uh, she was Stanislaus County Farm Advisor, now retired. Many probably wouldn't know Marcia as only one county's farm advisor, given um, the reach of her impact in engaging in critical dialogues and building capacity among her peers and in the community she serves. Um, and our second honoree is Keith Backman from Della Valley Laboratory. He's I don't know, technically he has titles, but I kind of think of him as a jack of all trades. Um, and likewise, Keith is known around the state for his engagement in you know, the important discussions of our, of our times and delivery of critical training to CCAs, farmers, and other ag professionals. Um, his demonstration of managing a leaching fraction with sugar cubes is, is memorable. You don't forget that, and both Marsha and Keith are great illustrations of really carrying what they know forward all the way to the people who really need to know it in a way that it really lands with impact. Um, 
So both of our honorees, Marsha and Keith, will be presented by people that they agreed could speak to their professional um, work. Marsha is presented by Carol Freight, who was also honored as an honoree in 2005. Um, no, 2015. Sorry, Carol. I took 10 years <laughs> off the of profession. Um, Carol is also a past president of this organization, and by way of example of her unique service, she developed intro computer classes for farmers, which I doubt was in her performance review for the year in which she worked on that kind of stuff. Um, and Keith is being presented by Nat Delavalle, who was honored in 2009 as an honoree, um, and is also a past president of this organization. And that service includes positions on a long list of advisory committees, um, most of which are typically unpaid. It's time and effort. He also, as a founding principal of Della Valley Laboratory, he has led his company to serve by being a longtime sponsor of this conference um, to create these critical, critical platforms for our, our California-centric discussions. So, Again, for the students, these are the great examples to follow, and I hope that you will enjoy hearing about uh, Marsha and Keith's careers. Please do check the bios that you can find in the link to the in the chat to this session. Um, and I'll just I'm going to pass this over, and the way we're going to run it this year is a tad bit different, just so we don't have to come back to me. Um, so I will um, turn it over to Carol in just a second, and then she will introduce and present to Marsha who will then hand off to Nat, who will then present to Keith, and then will come back to me for just a quick closing. So um, I don't think we're going to probably use the full hour, so please just stick around so that you don't miss something exciting. Um, so just before I hand off, I'll just say a successful career is more than being smart. It's using your smarts and your drive to serve. So now I'm going to hand to Carol and give her a chance to celebrate Marsha, our first honoree. Thank you, Karen. And um, good afternoon to all of you out there in Zoom land. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first of the two nominees today, um, Marsha Campbell. She's from Southern California and uh, was raised in Orange County when they still had some citrus there, but I don't want to age Marsha. Um, she was the middle of seven children. So the dynamics in that family, I'm sure were very exciting. She started at UC Davis, um, interested in writing and filmmaking. And you may wonder why Davis for that instead of UCLA, but Marsha wanted to get further away from home. So she went to Davis and took a broad array of classes, but it was when she took agronomy that she really got hooked and um, that became her passion and her career. She got her bachelor's of science in, uh, in plant science, and then went ahead to get her master's degree in um, agronomy and soils. But during that time when she was a student, she worked for visual media on campus. She also worked with one of the UC cooperative extension specialists, Ron Voss, and then did an internship with a farm advisor one summer. And all those experiences and her study interest led her to decide that what she wanted to do was to be a farm advisor with UC Cooperative Extension. Upon completing her master's in 1978, she was hired to be the farm advisor in Stanislaus County with the responsibility for primarily for forage crops for the dairy feed industry. She was not the very first female hired as a farm advisor, but the one or two that were hired prior to Marsha did not stay in um, cooperative extension for very long. So Marsha was the first one to make it her career as a farm advisor, first female. And I have to say that two years later, when I was deciding that I wanted to be a farm advisor with cooperative extension, it was nice to have someone who had broken through that glass ceiling and who could be my comrade at the meetings that were dominated by men. Not that that was all unpleasant, but it was nice to have a female around too. Um, early in her career, Marsha made a mark identifying several nutrient deficiencies that occurred in the sandy soils in her area. 
And these included potassium and alfalfa, potassium and sulfur and alfalfa in winter cereals, and zinc and phosphorus in corn. Now, it's hard to believe as you drive through field crop areas today um, that in the 1980s, you could pretty much, not 100%, but pretty much drive by fields and say, that field belongs to a dairy and that field is farmed by a non-dairy grower. And the difference was weeds. The dairy producers seemed to consider weeds as an addition to yield and unless they were poisonous, there was no problem with quality. But Marsha did some work early on looking at Johnson grass and corn and demonstrated conclusively that the Johnson grass reduced the, the yield and also reduced the quality of corn. And um, in that interest of getting interested in quality, she also became involved in getting involved in, in figuring out ways to transport rumen fluid so that the in vitro total digestibility analysis um, could be provided to growers using rumen fluid um, by the labs. Um, she also worked a lot with oat varieties, uh, testing new ones and introducing the successful uh, varieties in her trials and swan variety, which is still used today, was one that she identified. Interestingly, my colleague at the time, an agronomy farm advisor, Steve Wright in my county was so thankful that someone was getting information on oat varieties um, that he could share with our growers further south. In the late 1990s, nitrates in groundwater associated with sandy soils and high water tables and dairies became the focus of environmental concern, regulatory concern, and um, dairy viability concern. And that happened to be the situation in the dairy areas in Stanislaus and Merced counties. And about from that time, Marsha really concentrated on um, doing her research and extension program to address the issues that, that um, those conditions brought forth. She decided that it was important to address current issues, which was that one for their area, and to help growers and dairymen realize how to use this um, manure as a resource instead of a waste. And in particular, she worked a lot with the liquid manure or what we commonly call the lagoon water. So she, um, for many of her samples, and it wasn't easy in those days to sample lagoon water, she demonstrated the nitrogen and potassium value of this lagoon water. And at the time, the price of these fertilizers were going up. So the growers were quite receptive, relatively speaking, to maybe thinking of lagoon water in a different light. But how to get it from the lagoon to the crops at the right time, at the right rate, and for crop uptake and nutrient, and um, to uh, so that the yields would not be reduced and quality would not be minimized. So Marsha did a lot of work with flow meters, demonstrating which kinds would work with manure water. And also um, she sort of specialized in looking at the insertion meters that could be used from location to location and um, not just an expensive meter in one spot on the, on the dairy. She also did a lot of work in showing growers um, in how to place these meters to get the best bang for their buck and so that the meters would be accurate. And this included a lot of on-site demonstration um, meetings. Now you've got your meters and you got to get the water to the field. There's a lot of rate stuff to think about, the rate going through the meters, the rate of your irrigation and the timing. Marsha did a lot of um, lookup sheets, look uh, lookup tables and reference sheets so that people wouldn't be having to do all the calculations all the time. These were available in her hands out, handouts and on her website and at her meetings. Um, she hold, held scores of meetings and demonstrations 
And I have to say her presentations were always something people look forward to because of her um, enthusiasm when talking and also because of the quality of her visuals. And when we worked together on a workshop and we exchanged PowerPoints, I ended up having to get a better laptop because when she'd send me her PowerPoints, my regular laptop just crashed. There was so much to do. Um, based on her hands-on experience and her, her expertise in the area, Marsha was appointed to the UC Committee of Experts on Dairy Manure Management. And of all these things that she's done, when I asked Marsha what was she most proud of, and I have to say there's a lot in her, her, her bio that she should be proud of, she, she pointed out the work she did in looking at the systems with winter forages and especially adapted to the Northern San Joaquin Valley was the system of planting very high producing um, late maturing winter forages that then can be harvested in spring in the boot stage for excellent quality. And that system was it widely, has been widely adapted. Um, so Marsha truly made a mark on forage production in the Northern San Joaquin Valley, contributed, contributing to the state's ag industry. But she really, with her many, many meetings, her website, her excellent presentations, helped to get those things that she discovered and from other people also adapted by her growers and the uh, consultants in her area. But she was not all work and no play. Uh, Marsha has a lot of outside interests. She likes music, camping, canoeing, hiking. Um, very active in her church ministries. And she also breeds corn snakes of all things. <laughs> now that she's retired, she has even more time to do these and she's loving it. She um, now has a mountain cabin for which she did a tremendous amount of the construction and wiring and is still working on. And this is where she's joining us from today is from her cabin. And I just wanna say to you, Marsha, congratulations on your career and congratulations on this honor where you're being recognized by your peers. It's truly, truly deserved. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you, everybody. I think I'm supposed to um, hold this up. Um, can you see? Yeah, like that. And it says, um, presented to me, for distinguished, distinguished contributions to the advancement of human welfare and enhancement of California agriculture. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I, it's such an amazing thing to be recognized by my peers for doing what I absolutely have loved to do. I'm so humbled and honored and grateful. Um, I've always said that I had the best job in the world because I got paid a sal salary to do the things that I loved best, um, which is finding creative solutions to the issues that were most problematic for my clientele. And I'm also so grateful to all my colleagues who I've had the privilege of working alongside over the years. There are so many brilliant, creative people, too, too many to name, I, I won't even go there. Um, and also to the many wonderful growers who taught me so much and would do all sorts of crazy stuff for me, probably because they, they really knew that my passion was to help them to be successful. So they put up with all sorts of stuff. Like, like when I was first trying to measure how much nitrogen was being applied to fields at that time. Um, people thought there wasn't really any nutrient value in it. Um, how much was being in the, the lagoon water. And so during a, 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 a irrigation in the winter time, I was trying to, uh, I got this handheld flow meter. I was trying to put it down an air vent, but the air vent was so tall, I couldn't reach it. And so the grower, next thing I knew, the grower had sent like a loader with a big bucket of dirt, you know, to, to pile up so I could climb up on this mountain of dirt and actually, you know, do my sample. Um, and it was such a kind thing to do and so unexpected. Um, 
But on that, I remember I kept redoing the math and redoing the math because, because the numbers were coming out to be like hundreds of pounds. And that's actually when it was supposed to be negligible. Um, that's really where this whole thing started to where, oh my goodness, there actually is nutrient value in this, in this manure water and we need to like not overload the fields. Um, and so after I started doing a lot of work on that and showing that there was nutrient value in the lagoon water, uh, I, I had this field day, all right? And it was on the bank of, of a lagoon, which is, you know, where all this liquid manure is being held, all right? And, and there, these are really big, okay? And I was gonna talk about flow meters, so we were gonna do the field day on the, the canal bank. And the grower said, don't worry about it, we'll set it up. It's like, okay. So I come out in the morning, first field day that I didn't have to do any of the setup. And there's all these on this lagoon bank, okay? On the, there are all of these white chairs with white tablecloths and um, white umbrellas and platters of cheese and, and fruit. And, and it looked like there was a wedding on in a manure pond, <laughs> in a manure pond. They'd even built they'd even built stairs down to the neighbor's field, so that people could park and walk up the stairs instead of climbing the sides of the manure bank. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, um, but then uh, the growers started like using lagoon water then instead of their their fertilizer and then I got complaints from the fertilizer dealers in the area that their sales were down because the growers were using the manure water instead of buying nitrogen okay so so and then okay so guys are never happy right so another complaint I got was when uh, I had a test plot in a grower's field and he saw this little plot okay they're only like 100 square feet of this variety that he really liked it was dirk and wheat and, and he liked it. So next year he planted 3000 acres. It's like, oh my gosh, you don't do that. You know, like, <laughs> all right. And so, so I was like sweating it, you know? So I went out at harvest and to see how much he liked it. And he says, well, he was, he didn't, he said, I don't like it. It's like, oh no, oh no. He says, the yields are so big that the harvesters have to slow down. They're clogging up. It's like, seriously? <laughs> okay, so, so there was plenty of successes, but there was like lots of epic failures too. Like, like the time a grower had a field with a corner that just wouldn't drain. And so I checked the soil map, you know, and, and found that there was hard pan in that, that corner. So, so I said, well, why don't you just take a backhoe and, and like punch a hole in it so that the water would actually drain. And so I get this, this panic phone call from him. They had the backhoe out there and the hole was filling up full of water. It was, it, the, the, the water, the, the hard pan was actually holding the water table back and it was an artesian system. And so there was all this water bubbling up through this hole. And he said, is, is, uh, he says this question, uh, my question is, does concrete set underwater? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Okay, so uh, when I started, I was 23. I was fresh out of college. It was the only job I wanted, the only one I applied for, and it was waiting for me when I graduated. But when I started, boy, the obstacles were daunting. The agriculture in Stanislaus County, County with its sandy soils and, and, and everything was absolutely nothing like anything I'd studied at Davis. And the field assistants would deliberately sabotage my test plots and leave porn under my door because they really resented working for a very young woman who clearly didn't have a clue what she was doing. And, and on that point, I had to admit they were right. I, I couldn't even bear to read my job description because it would make me cry. It looked so impossible. And I didn't know anything. I remember asking a kind old farmer to explain to me the difference between a cow and a heifer and making him promise he wouldn't tell anybody that I'd asked. 
<laughs> so many times I wanted to quit, but there had been so many serendipitous and outright miraculous events to get me there that I knew that this wasn't really a job, it was an assignment and that I was supposed to be there so that somehow I was gonna make it. One thing that COVID has taught us is who the real heroes are and what essential really looks like. We who work to serve the agricultural industry aren't just doing a job. We're part of a bigger picture and we definitely are essential. Like me, it's no accident that you are here. You were made to do this. And if you were placed here, that means that you can expect that the creator who gave you this assignment will help you and will guide you and reward you. Stephen Mather was the architect of the National Park System in the early 1900s. I came across his memorial plaque at a high place on a remote mountain with ancient bristlecone trees. The last line of the plaque reads, there will never come an end to the good that he has done. And that is what I want to say over each one of you. You are not on your own. You were put here for a bigger purpose. You are not an accident of nature. You are uniquely appointed to be in this time and in this place and you are enough. He's in charge of providing all that you need to accomplish your task. If you work pro not primarily for profit or reputation, but to do good that will outlast you, you will always have enough and you will always be enough because your father who is deeply passionate about your well-being will partner with you to complete what he made you to do. And that will bring you joy. <laughs> so thank you again. I am so humbled and honored to be recognized by my peers for getting to do what God made me to do. And now it's my great privilege to introduce and pass this over to Nat Della Valley, founder of Della Valley Labs, who will introduce our very next very deserving honoree Keith Backman, both of these men I greatly admire. Thank you, Marsha. <clears throat> it's an honor to introduce Keith Backman, a 2021 California chapter of the American Society of Agronomy honoree. Keith was raised on a Sutter County 40 acre orchard where he became familiar with peaches, walnuts, and almonds. He and three brothers saved for college by raising and selling tomatoes from their roadside stand. Keith graduated from Yuba City High and Yuba Community College where he majored in science. Keith received bachelor's and master's degrees from UC Davis where he majored in pomology. About the time Keith received his master's, he applied to a predecessor of Della Valley Laboratory where a pomologist was needed. We had just signed a contract with a farm management company serving several thousand acres of tree fruit. Well, the farm management company went bankrupt before Keith reported to work. At that time, we had a lot of Akela cotton under contract. Those of you who remember Akela know that it could be tall, very tall. We reasoned that if you reached up to get a tissue sample, you were sampling a tree. And Keith adapted, showing his flexibility. Before long, he added many acres of stone fruit, almonds, and walnuts to be served. And clients asked questions for which there were no answers in the literature or in his background. At the time, the established interpretive tissue concentrations were for samples collected in mid midsummer, but clients wanted to know how much nitrogen to apply in the spring. So client 
Keith collected information by collecting a series of springtime samples and developing a system relating springtime leaf samples to nitrogen status. He answered the client's question accurately, predicted nitrogen requirements, and added to our tool basket. We're still using his techniques today, and he continues to innovate. It was decades later that the university sciences conducted research on the method that Keith originated. He made similar advances with irrigation management of tree crops. Keith continues his innovative way of solving problems and answering questions and serving a lot of people. Keith Backman has been a frequent presenter at the annual meeting of the California chapter and other events. His speaking engagements have included West, the Western Nutrient Management Conference, the California Fertilizer Conferences, FREP Conferences, CCA classes, and others. He has been a frequent guest lecturer at University Nutrient Management and Community College classes. He shares his talent freely. Keith, Keith has served as the secretary of, of the California chapter Excuse me, he has served as secretary for the California CCA board for over 10 years. He's also served on the international exam committee for the certified crop advisor program. He most recently assisted the Western Plant Health Association Soil Improvement Committee with their upcoming edition of the Western Fertilizer Handbook, where he was the key author of the new nutrient management and irrigation management chapters. In addition, he has served as a scoutmaster and district leader in Boy Scouts for over 20 years. Keith and his wife, Gail, split their time between their homes in Hanford, Santa Cruz, and Storm Lake, Iowa. Now, why would anyone want a home in Storm Lake, Iowa? Isn't that Hurricane Alley? Well, they want to be near their two children and two grandchildren who live there. Their son, Dr. Nathan Backman, lives in Storm Lake where he teaches computer science at Buena, Buena Vista University. Their daughter, Hope, also lives in Storm Lake where she teaches kindergarten. Keith, you have been a valued colleague from whom I have learned much. We val have valued your service on the board of directors where you served from the firm's inception. Keith in his semi-retirement continues to serve as a technical consultant. Passing his information and his wealth of knowledge and skill to younger colleagues. Keith, it's been a pleasure to be your colleague and it is indeed a pleasure to introduce you as a 2021 California chapter honoree. Thank you, Nat. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it's been an honor working with uh, the agriculture in, in Central California and the Central Coast and yeah. consulting. It's been uh, 45 years I've been doing that now. It's uh, been uh, working with small farmers, working with large farmers, extremely large farmers, and they've all got, uh, you know, special needs, uh, the special problems they need solutions to that uh, are adapted, need to be adapted for their scale, their problems, the variations on their ranches. And it's, it's been a challenge and a great thing. And sometimes it's great to just to work with a little 10 acre farmer who only has one commodity and it's crashing and needs help. And, uh, you know, sometimes you feel like, uh, you know, you're driving an ambulance and in certain areas, you just, you just got people that, that need to have their ranch saved in some situations from various situations. But I thought I'd reflect a little bit on the 45 years I've been consulting. And uh, one of the things that uh, jumps up in, in my mind is the, uh, the innovations uh, 
in using data and things of the sort. I came from Davis carrying a slide rule. You know, there weren't any calculators that weighed less than uh, 30 pounds back then. And uh, it was a couple of years before you could get some of the little small electronic ones that cost $120 and they'd multiply and subtract and divide. Uh, really excellent, $125 when the minimum age was, minimum wage was like a buck 50. Uh, they were expensive, but the company got me one of those. So, hey, calculators were great. Another challenge is uh, I worked out of remote offices and to get the data from the laboratory, to me, you know, we've got a great laboratory, but I was working in the Tulare office for a while. They had to, to drive it to Fresno at night put it in an envelope, I had to wait for a courier to come down Highway 99 on its way to Bakersfield and snag the data. And um, that's that was turnaround time, it added to it. And so then they invented fax machines, which were amazing items. And then, uh, well, about then, a little bit before uh, computers came online. And I remember the first time I saw a spreadsheet, I went, you know, what the heck? is this thing, how can I use it? And I took it home and played with it for two weeks on a, on a computer. And uh, they're running floppy disks back then. And I had a grower, a large grower, South Lake Farms on the west side, Devil's Den, that had 30 cotton fields. And about 10 of them had a huge crop loss down to less than half of the production. And they were just pulling their hair out. This is the end of the year when the production numbers came in. And so I took that spreadsheet and I put columns in there with what the phosphate level was, what the pH was, what the uh, sodium levels were, ESPs, and uh, what day they planted, how much water they put on, everything I could figure out for each of these 30 fields. And then I sorted by the production number and noticed right away that all of the fields that had the huge crop loss were planted within 72 hours of each other. And looking back, we found out that uh, it had rained just about just prior to that. And those fields, the seedlings started rotting in the soil. And it was easy to, to pick that out once you had the data on a spreadsheet, once you collated it. And I decided right then, you know, there's a place in this world for spreadsheets. And I've worked with them ever since. And uh, it's a great thing. And, and computers in general, handling data was a major part of life in this situation. My poor son, Nathan, when we were at home and he was a little guy, um, all his neighbors had, uh, you know, Nintendos and Game Boys and things like that. And I decided, no, let's, let's get a game on the computer. You need to learn this keyboard thing. We, we need to uh, understand that uh, computers are part of education, not just little uh, game doodads you hold in your hand. So. He, he grew up that way and I think it helped him as, you know, you probably heard Nat, Nat just said he got his PhD, Brown University, and uh, uh, it didn't, didn't hurt him a bit understanding computer at a, at a young age. So I'd use those for irrigation monitoring, tracking the amount of water plants use, how much is in the root zone, being able to find out how much usable water is in, in the root zone, and then calculating when the next irrigation is. If it's a flood irrigation, whether it's 21 days or 19 days, makes a lot of differences on a ranch. When you knock down berms and things of the sort, it depends on the first one that's going to need the water. And that type of data fits into a lot of different situations, knowing the usage rate and the date of depletion. Also, uh, during my tenure doing this, ran into so many other things that uh, are important. Uh, I had some background in, so we processed uh, doing E. coli and coliform bacteria on drinking water wells. Uh, you know, um, farm uh, farm labor camps were getting. Um, it wasn't the it was the state health department then, not the regional board requirements. So we adapted and became special samplers and moved more things into our laboratory regarding uh, heavy metals, foods, uh, drinking water safety, nitrates. Uh, then we expanded into, um, I worked a lot in the food safety realm. Uh, we actually did some meat packing plants regarding the uh, Jack in the Box industry uh, problem about 30 years ago where E. coli was the first, um, first food safety issue out there. 
and uh, we do listeria. Still today, we do a lot of packing sheds, food safety, uh, wastewater analyses. Um, another thing that every day at work, you know, for 45 years is uh, nutrient management. Obviously, the laboratory uh, sends out sheets of data and myself and my associates as consultants interpret the data, but trying to figure the right time, the right place to put the nutrients on. I was developing pages and charting systems uh, and uh, when to do that. And got a fairly reasonable one put together and as nitrogen management became more of a realm, I was asked to speak on at the Western Nutrient Conference, which is a gathering of all the researchers that meet on the Western US uh, soil science and plant scientists. And I, I spoke to that group several times regarding it. One of the committees that I've done a lot of work on and I really appreciated uh, you know, the great exchange is the Soil Improvement Committee on the Western Plant Health Association that I've volunteered on and worked on a lot of situations. And for the upcoming Western Fertilizer Handbook, the discussions came up, we had to have something on nitrogen. And so I made a presentation regarding some of the things that I've done, worked on some of my nitrogen management paperwork, and we put together a semi-official uh, nitrogen management handling situation, sort of based on a spreadsheet. And when the state of California requested something of the uh, committee as a way to approach farmers maintain, monitoring nutrient management, they used that template. So that template went in there and uh, has been used um, for the state as a basis for a lot of the nutrient management paperwork. Um, that is uh, being required by the, by the um, state water board. Well, and then as Nat said, we've got a new edition of the uh, Western Fertilizer Handbook coming out in the near future. COVID is probably moving some timelines around a little bit. I had a lot to do with the, uh, with the uh, nutrient management uh, chapter and the irrigation chapter on that. And that should be coming out hopefully in the next year or so. I don't know, maybe Jerome's out there and can chime something in. But uh, I've enjoyed being on the California CCA board. Uh, I was a board member for quite a few years and uh, the secretary for a lot of that time. I, I'm on the CCA uh, California exam committee. I've been helping with that over time. Uh, the manure management, I helped uh, write the exam committee uh, paperwork for that and the, made several trips to Madison, Wisconsin uh, to help prepare the uh, international CCA exam. That half of the test that it, it's, it's better now. It took me a while to uh, work with the powers that be in uh, Madison and realize that California agriculture is a little bit different than Iowa, Nebraska, and Texas. And we had to readjust some of the questions that weren't, because there's some situations where one answer is right, in that area and wrong in our area. So we had to uh, adapt some of those. And uh, going on from there. And, and it's been great over the time, mentoring young agriculturists has been discussed so far. We've got a lot of you out there. There's amazing opportunities ahead. Uh, food is only becoming more important every year. Conserv conserving water and keeping it pure is more important every year. So this agricultural thing is uh, a large situation. Years ago, I was, as we got into more of the food safety and things, I was, you know, one of these days, nearly 50% of what we will be doing might end up being environmental work. Well, now all you got to do is open a, a piece of paper and you realize every nitrogen fertilizer application, every dollop of a nutrient is also in the environmental realm. So what we do is strictly we are the frontline environmentalists you know i tell people that you know if if there's a spill of anything anywhere and it doesn't land necessarily on concrete or asphalt it's an agricultural situation whether or not you damage the soil is going to depend on what can grow there in the future anyway thanks to uh, nat della valley for introducing me uh, to all the consultants staff chemists and all of our associates at della valley laboratory Thanks to all the UC and extension people that have helped uh, me over the years. And I've worked with a lot, shoulder to shoulder on a lot of different committees and things. I'd like to say thanks to my wife, Gail, who's over here in the corner listening. 
uh, wife of 48 years. She's a, uh, a retired teacher and a uh, part-time puppy raiser for guide dogs for the blind. Uh, my uh, very proud of my children, uh, son Nathan, the professor at Buena Vista University, my daughter Hope, who uh, teaches, who taught in uh, San Jose for a period of time, got her master's degree in teaching and now teaches in Storm Lake, Iowa. And I'm still involved. I'm not 100% retired. Uh, I work a few days a month um, mentoring some of the uh, young uh, agronomists in our company and uh, taking care of administrative things uh, for the board of directors at Della Valley. So thanks to the, uh, the ASA board for nominating me and approving me. It's, uh, it's been a, a great life for 45 years in agriculture and I'm still around a little bit. People can still contact me and uh, I uh, appreciate the nomination and appreciate the uh, honoring of the award. And I'm, I'm currently in Kona, Hawaii, so I didn't bring the big plaque, which weighs about uh, enough to be about 20% uh, of a suitcase. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thank you and congratulations to both Marsha and Keith. I wish that we could um, have a way for them to hear our applause. I hope people will keep chiming in there on the chat. Um, it looks like there's a lot coming in there, and I'm told that they will be able to capture that for you, Marsha and Keith. So A&R will get that to you. Um, so thanks for joining us, everyone, today. I, I, I really do wish we could hear that applause. Um, for those, these are, these are some people who've committed their professional lives to service and to throwing themselves at the challenges as they emerged from you know, their, their professional lives. Um, and we have a very productive state with um, highly sophisticated operations all the way down to, as Keith said, some 10 acre operations with folks learning the basics. And, these are the models of service we can all look to. And again, to the students watching, I hope you will read these bios and think about which way you want to go as you continue to develop your professional lives. But for those of us who can make noise, can we um, clap for um, Carol and Nat and Nick and uh, anybody who can unmute and clap, let's give them a quick round of applause and then we'll let folks have a couple minutes. So thank you and congratulations. I think I'm the only one that can be heard. Anyway, congratulations, guys. And Keith, travel safely and um, stay out of the snow, Marsha. <laughs>